chairman of the National Science Foundation to welcome and deliver the opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Hi, Bowen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Distinguished resource persons joining the webinar from Canada, USA, UK, and Australia, namely Professor Dilanto Fernando, Dean Studies, University of Manitoba, Professor Aruna Virasuriya, he is the Chair, Plant Science and Environment, Texas AM University, USA. Professor Danture Vikramasinghe from University of Glasgow and Professor Saman Halgamgi, University of Melbourne and Professor Nadira Karunavira, moderator, Professor Prasad Jayavira, who is really helping us with the digital platform, dear academics, scientists and graduate students, joining this webinar. First, on behalf of the National Science Foundation, I wish to extend a most warm and cordial welcome to especially our distinguished galaxy of high-profile scientists joining this webinar despite their busy schedule and heavy preoccupation. When we invited them, they readily accepted our invitation to share their knowledge, experience, their expertise, and also network to the benefit of Sri Lankan community, mainly in academia and R&D institutions. Also, we have our Professor Nadira, moderator, who is also the chair of the research arm of the National This Science meeting Office. is being recorded. Uh, then our Office of the International Cooperation, Mr. Shant, and I also especially welcome the participants who have actually joined this in large number, given the relevance and importance of this webinar. This webinar we organized with a view to enhancing the academic and research programs of high education institutions in our country. We know that uh, there are over 3 million Sri Lankans living abroad and fair proportion of them holding senior positions in academia and R&D institutions and some also in the industry. They are very keen to contribute, share their knowledge and experience with the motherland, but there has been no credible and pragmatic mechanism for them to contribute. Because of this reason, the National Science Foundation constructed a digital platform to harness this hitherto almost untapped and untouched intellectual asset and resource for the national development and also to offer opportunities from our yeah. end so that there would be mutually rewarding and reinforcing partnership. Today we are living in a globalized environment where quality and relevance, when you talk about quality relevance, we can talk about Sri Lankan standard or SARC standard or Asian it has to be global, international standard. And we would like our scientists to occupy on the frontiers of knowledge and take a share in moving them forward. Confucius said, by birth, people are same. Through nurture, they become distinct. So the, here, the purpose of this, that means whether you are born in USA, Ethiopia, Canada, or Sri Lanka, inherently at birth you are same. But uh, your blossoming depends on how you are nurtured and fostered. That is why 
NSF trying to create that atmosphere decided to really harness these intellectual assets for the benefit of our motherland. You see, when you, you may have seen their background, we have scientists representing biological sciences, physical sciences, humanities and social sciences. So it will cover practically the whole range of discipline hmm, in our higher education landscape. And during the course of presentation, our distinguished resource persons will talk about the emerging trends, new areas that are emerging that would enable you to keep abreast of the latest development in your field of work. In addition, you are interested in advancing your career, bettering your prospects, and scaling greater heights through capacity building and competency enhancement. So in the course of their deliberations, delivery, they would also share their knowledge and experience and also talk about opportunities that you could really embrace in order to scale greater heights, maybe opportunities about higher education, maybe collaborative research, joint uh, academic work, or maybe uh, sabbatical positions, conducting joint seminars, or requesting them to conduct certain courses, webinars on special topics. This is a whole array of areas open. They will touch upon and our participants would be able to really during the course of discussion and through the chat box to, to present their questions to the speakers. With this brief uh, introductory remarks, I conclude my welcome address and I wish this great evening success. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening the uh, scope of the digital platform and purpose and the uh, opportunities available at a glance. Thank you. And the next item is I'm going to do uh, very briefly the so far the achievements uh, made with regard to NSF digital platform. I will touch upon very briefly. Uh, we have completed the development of the digital platform almost 99% fine-tuning are there, but the environment is not conducive for launching. We will do it once the environment becomes conducive. In the database, uh, in the back end of the digital platform, there are more than 750 expatriates registered uh, representing leading universities from around the world, eminent expatriates in wide array of uh, ex uh, disciplines from uh, life sciences, engineering, management, social sciences, and also uh, emerging interdisciplinary sciences such as nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, IoT, robotics, data science, and etc. etc. So we have a, a huge talent pool to tap for the advancement of our country innovation ecosystem. So we have identified group of expatriates who engage actively in research uh, addressing the national high priority concerns in our country as well as in the regional relevance. So we can do the matchmaking for synergy creation. We can connect them with the, our Sri Lankan research groups. We have already requested our university system and R&D institutions submit your request pertaining to the uh, international collaboration, maybe remote supervision, your interest, tell us so that we could do the necessary facilitation. I'm happy to highlight that we have been already receiving many requests. We are uh, doing the partnership building. We have done uh, many uh, already series of webinars and online meetings uh, so that cutting edge knowledge transfer is facilitated already. To just to mention two webinars, one on, uh, as you all know, 
salinity is a problem with the uh, compounding effect from the climate change. So addressing with the issue, we have organized one webinar, which was held on 31st May. One of the leading expatriate, Professor Jayant Obesekara, Sea Level Solution uh, Center, Florida Institute of University, USA. He participated the, uh, and he shared his best practices and cutting edge knowledge to mitigate and uh, cope up with the salinity problems. Then we organized one another webinar jointly with IESL and the SLAS on uh, writing, uh, targeting high impact journal. I, 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 I have to highlight there are 165 particip uh, 765 participants, including young researchers. So we hope our uh, visibility, Sri Lanka's visibility in the global presence of high scholarly journals uh, article publications will enhance in future. So I won't take much time. Ap apart from that, we have young engineers uh, around the globe uh, who excel in engineering field, young researchers. One, uh, there is one design engineer in Boeing, one uh, young engineer in uh, Rolls Royce who have provided the leadership to uh, established the largest uh, uh, airplane repair center in Florida, USA, I think. So uh, we have a, a huge potential and we are in the process of tapping the potential. So uh, apart from that, we are in the process of tapping our expatriate to transfer cutting edge, uh, cutting edge technology to infuse with our, uh, bring the, our SME and industry to the next value chain of the technology, uh, including uh, today's demand in uh, sector like green, a uh, high capacity energy, energy storage technology, harnessing our natural resources. So I don't take much time. That's a glimpse about the achievement of our digital platform. So uh, uh, then I will move on to the next item. So uh, I want to, uh, uh, make announcement. We have already done the uh, with our previous mail communications how our proceedings will move. Since uh, quite number of uh, higher number of participants are there, we will facilitate your questions outmost as much as possible. So, uh, if you have any question to specific to an eminent speaker, you can post in the chat box. So speaker will answer to those questions then and there. If, if you have general question, you also post that so that it will line up to the question and answer session. So during the Q&A session, uh, those questions will be addressed as much as possible. So uh, if any unanswered question is remain, no worry. After the event, we will make a facilitation definitely to give an answer uh, with a facilitation with our panel of speakers, communicate, and we will make a facilitation to give you an answer. That would be the way of uh, further proceeding. So uh, accordingly, I now am honored to invite uh, the first of our expatriate eminent speaker, Professor Saman K. Halgamuge, Department of Mechanical Engineering, the University of Melbourne. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Shantaseri, and um, thank you, Professor Rajasena Ratna, for inviting me. And I born Vanakam, and good afternoon. So um, uh, while I'm sharing my slides with you, uh, let me also congratulate the uh, National Science Foundation on the digital platform. All right. Can you sh see my slides? Everything okay? Yes. Okay. So I have about 20 minutes to um, talk about my input. And uh, so, um, so, Rather than going through all my introduction, I would highlight that currently I am a um, adjunct um, or honorary professor of SLIT, and I was previously um, 
are doing similar activities at the University of Peradeniya, National Institute of Fundamental Studies, Kendi, and I was also uh, Professor V.K. Samarayak and our chair, Professor of University of Melbourne, again, a visiting professor status. Okay, so um, now in the first part of my talk, I'll be giving an analysis of Sri Lanka's research output. And you may see during all the talks how this can be relevant. And because we, sh we should first uh, understand where we are. And, but this, this is um, given not to discourage anyone so, um, or to insult anyone. So, but that is um, uh, from a major database. And if you have heard of um, Scopus and which is currently being used in um, many, many ranking bodies, and uh, so because it has a really good coverage of science and engineering and mainly. So I have taken all the research outputs until um, 2020. So I have done this on Sunday. So it's very, very recent, Sunday, a few days ago. So now um, I just put these things and I, I plotted two, uh, three Indian universities. Two are really well-known engineering institutions and University of Delhi which is a bit like University of Colombo in terms of reputation. And all the Sri Lankan universities, all the key ones um, and here. And don't worry about the Sri Lankan universities. I will expand that and explain a little bit. But first of all, we have to understand that even though some people may look at Indian universities um, not so positively, and they are doing pretty well, some of them, not all of them, but some of their key universities, universities are doing extremely well, especially in comparison to Sri Lanka. So these are scholar, scholarly outputs in this index database and which consists of journals plus some um, conference proceedings as well. So now, since it is difficult to see the Sri Lankan universities um, here, and what I do is now I delete the Indian three universities just to see how we are doing. So these are the nine Sri Lankan universities. And it's quite interesting to see that the Colombo and Peradin universities are really um, consistently on top. And the Moratu making a brave attempt. So around 2015, you can see that it is increasing quite significantly and going down a little bit, but still it made an uh, impact to become um, up to differentiate from the rest of the university. So this is something that uh, our friends in University of Morato should go back and look. What did you do closer to 2015? So probably a couple of years earlier. You may get a hint of that when I, when I proceed with this um, slides. So it's interesting to see the other interesting fact is also to see University of Jaffna. So I'm, I'm a friend of University of Jaffna and I would like to see more support for University of Jaffna to get back to the glory that it had well before the, the, the end of the war. And so otherwise you see that it is, it is stagnated somewhere here. So SLIT, congratulations, and increasing quite nicely and most, mostly in the recent years. Okay. So um, now this is an interesting one. So how many publications do we have as a Sri Lanka in, in this Corpus database? And 31,551 documents. And the oldest one is done in 1,836. Not too bad, right? So I'll show you this. And uh, But the fact is that about half of these publications are done since 2015. So it's an in interesting uh, way to look at uh, how well Sri Lanka has been doing in recent years. So now the main messages from this is um, do not publish in menus that may not have an impact. So except that you want to go and, you know, present something and network because otherwise it will not count. You can have thousand different conferences one each for every department in every single university and a journal for every single university, as long as they are not indexed, as long as 
I mean, as long as they are not indexed, they mean nothing, okay? At least not for the research output, but they mean something for networking. So they have their values, but be careful in uh, having too many of these things that have no impact on, on, the, on the actual research landscape. So try to get quality experts to work with you. Why am I saying that with these numbers? You will see that some of these papers, especially the papers with very high impact, have quite a lot of international collaborations. So I say this uh, in interesting statement here. So you may not know how to get them to pay their dues. This is my experience. Other people may share that with you. We want to help. We want to pay our dues because we were educated in Sri Lanka and, and we went to university for free, okay? And paid by the taxpayers, most of us. So we want to give something back, but sometimes you may not know how to do that. So I think digital platform is doing a significant role in, in bridging this divide. Collaborate with quality colleagues in other Sri Lankan universities. You have really good colleagues in Sri Lankan universities, but one university has to go and talk to colleagues in the other university. And I have to ask, why not? Because I haven't seen that much of this is happening. All right, most experts may like to help institutions. And this is why we help individuals, right? But our actual goal is to help universities, uh, institutions, and in, in brief Sri Lanka. So way of doing that would be to help individuals. Okay, so now I get back to my um, analysis here. So this is the most impactful uh, research paper um, published by Sri Lanka. And um, so the reason I'm saying that is two things. The number of citations, that's one way to look at it, but it's it, there's another way to look at it. This is very important. Some of you may not know that. It's called field-weighted citation impact. So if you have these 8,550 citations in medicine, that may not mean much because in medicine, papers get a lot of citations. But if you have the same in an area like this, it, it means quite a bit. And this is what the field weighted citation impact says, tells you. If this number here, field weighted citation impact or FWCI is less than one, that means your paper is below average, okay? So try to publish papers that will get this um, better than one FWCI, and then you are making a contribution to Sri Lanka. Otherwise, you may not, okay? So again, now this is probably of interest. So, okay, I can see some, um, maybe I try to clear this. Okay, where does that come from? Okay, so um, now can the moderator clear up these yellow lines on the screen appearing if possible? Um, yeah, but I continue. So this is the oldest paper. Um, published um, by, um, by Sri Lanka. So it's quite interesting to see. And uh, so Colbrook, you probably heard, have heard of Colbrook Commission. So, so he published this paper in eight, eight, uh, 1836. Um, and this is quite interesting and, um, and, and the topic of it. And uh, so now this is the, the old publications that Sri Lanka has published. 30, little over 31,000 in this index database, which is quite commonly used. So you may or may not like the fact that your paper is not there. But the important thing is, the truth is, the world is looking at the country through these databases, and they rank your universities based on these databases. So, so whether you like it or not, and this is this is the fact. So you, you may not like me for saying this to this, but I'm the messenger, okay? So now interesting thing, if you look at the, the subject areas versus publication numbers, so you can see the medicine is quite good, over 9,000 papers, engineering, agricultural, biological sciences, computer sciences, and so on. So now I want to move from this slide to a slide that, um, that shows... Um, perhaps the, 
um, the more recent, the last five to six years publications. Where did Sri Lanka publish in the last five to six years? So it hasn't changed that much, but I would like you to look at this block on decision sciences and the chemistry. So what happened is, as you know, the AI and decisions, decision sciences are quite popular. And therefore you can see that decision sciences became more prominent and relative to chemistry. If you look at the last five to six years. Otherwise, this, the major areas that we are publishing hasn't changed that much, right? And uh, there are changes, I mean, but for the purpose of this talk, and it is good to see there's a, some consistency and in, in the areas we publish. And then this is about the um, number of publication versus the, the year of publication. So it's, it's quite, interesting to see that to, uh, that there was a steady increase, okay? I mean, 2021 is still not over, so therefore, please ignore the number for 2021. So it's a, it's a very healthy increase, okay? And um, so, again, this diagram is not completed as well. So what you can see here is 2013 and 14, and there's no such increase, so... If, if you're really interested, you may you may check why. Why there is no significant increase or not, not an increase at all. So why is it the case? So there's a lot of data that you can use to analyze the research landscape of a country as well. So um, now, what are the countries Sri Lanka collaborate with? So again, not a surprise. UK, United States, Australia, India, Japan, China, and so on and so on, okay? So they are on top. And so now when I, this is for all years, but when I go to the next slide and it is for last five to six years and you, there will be some changes. For example, China goes up and Japan goes down slightly, okay? But still very active. So it's quite interesting to see. Um, and um, so you may see this China's increase um, collaboration uh, with Sri Lanka also in funding. So this is sponsors of these 31,000 plus uh, index papers. Who funded them? Because you usually acknowledge the funder in, in your papers. So you can see that National Science Foundation is probably the top, but then you can see um, this is for all years and still these two institutions from China, Chinese, Chinese Academy of Sciences, very prestigious. And, uh, and, and they are still funding. And now one of my friends at uh, Sri Jayawadhanapur University, Professor Hiran Amansekara told me that it's not only NSF funding research, increasingly individual universities are funding research at, in, at the universities. You can see that University of Morato here and other universities, if you go down further, you can see that they are funding. So now what has happened uh, if I move from here to the last five to, six, five to six years, so recent years, what has changed? So you can see that China has gone up in, in, um, in this list, all right? So this is interesting, and, um, and, and this, is, um, um, this, this is reflective of our collaboration uh, patterns, and, and um, because if you, if you collaborate with someone and you get funded as well, and uh, or it may not be you who get this funding. It may be your collaborator who is acknowledging this funding organization as well. So now this is again the, the total number of um, publications. If you look at the affiliations, right? And this is similar to the chart you have seen before. Sri Lankan University is coming here on top, no surprise. And, um, and here University is of Jaffna still very good if you look at the overall picture. And uh, so, but you can also see that um, uh, if you jump to the right-hand side column, you can see the, the recent last five to six years um, and, and um, the, the, the publication numbers, you can see that Sri Lanka is actually doing well in terms of international collaboration. So because University of Auckland, Mal uh, Malaya in Malaysia, Korea, and so this is actually University of Helsinki, John Huff, Johns Hopkins and uh, Seoul National University, and they're coming uh, here, and because they collaborated with Sri Lankan 
uh, researchers, and this is why they are featured here. So this is for the last five and six years, five to six years, and and this is for the whole um, four years. Okay, since eight. 1836. So now I think that is my first part um, about um, giving a, um, some analysis of research outputs and how would other people, the rest of the world, view Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka's publications. And so now the second part, I want to talk about the, the more relevant aspect to you, but it's probably um, good to understand where we come from. Where do we stand in the research landscape? Okay. So now my first slide here in the second part is what are the hot areas to do PhD or research training? Because most of you may be interested in doing PhD or uh, if you have a PhD, maybe taking some further training and so on. So what are the hot areas? What are the coming up areas? So the, my answer to that is not to pinpoint you on one area or another, okay? There are so many ways of finding that out. You can Google it. You can find out, you can go to MIT and website and, and some of major universities um, and um, you know display the number of areas, coming up technologies like blockchains and uh, by, uh, by, uh, biomedical uh, engineering and AI data science and, you know, and also very crucial problems that we have to um, solve, like, you know, pandemic driven um, things and energy problem, water problem, climate change. And in Sri Lanka in particular, now um, looking into the um, preservation of the beaches and so on, all given, given what is going on electric vehicles and so on. There are all these different topics there. But my point here is, I think you should actually look at yourself to understand what you, are, what you want to do. It's a passion. So you can't do a PhD if you do not fall in love with the, with the, um, with the topic. So, uh, and that is, should be the major criteria. I mean, I will never be able to do a PhD topic for myself if I don't like that, if I'm really not passionate about it. Right. If I cannot think about that topic when I go to bed, okay, when I sleep, and so on. So that is important. And then, then the important thing is to find the right group um, to write to, and be prepared to write to many. Sometimes, not to get an answer. So I, I talk about that later, and I tell you why you don't want to get an answer. So now, popular recently is also joint PhDs. Right, and many Sri Lankan universities are offering that. And maybe you can do this joint PhD, and that means a couple of years working with a Sri Lankan supervisor in Sri Lanka, and another couple of years working overseas with overseas researcher, and you get a PhD jointly offered by two institutions. Okay, that is possible. And do a PhD in Sri Lanka University, right? At the moment, and given the pandemic, you can't go um, travel as much. And so maybe, that is an option. And what matters most is the quality outcomes, right? And that is very important, regardless of where you do your PhD. What people will look at is what is the outcome of your PhD thesis? What are the publications? What are the patents? Okay. What did you develop? Did you implement it? Oh, and, and that sort of um, outcomes. Okay. The second detail slide I have here is what do you do if you do not have the CV required? and you think your CV is not good enough, never give up. I did not have the CV required to do what I want to do. And it took many years for me to get there. First thing is to understand where you stand, where are you, okay? And what is your country's research profile? What is the research profile of your university? There's nothing to be ashamed of because from wherever you are, you can get to where you want to go, right? You just need to be truthful, find out, and then invest your time. Understand your potential. Pandemic. So what are your options? Okay. There must, must be options available. What are they? So choose the research group, an area, and the university, as opposed to choosing the country. Unless you have non-academic reasons to go. Okay, so these are popular countries and all have some excellent universities. Check the rankings. 
And once you get a PhD, don't say that I have a PhD from Australia. Just say the PhD from University of Melbourne or whatever the university's name. So that is, that matters, okay? Not the country. So you write to potential supervisor host and you do not get any reply, why? Few reasons I can think of, right? So we, we usually get so many emails, right? And I usually try to answer every single one coming from Sri Lanka and so on. But sometimes I may miss it, right? So why is genuinely busy? One reason, there is no vacancy, right? Team is full and you are, you are, and, and so it's possible that you won't get an answer. Your CV is not good fit, another reason. And fourth reason is your mail did not reach the supervisor host, which you wouldn't know. So all possibilities are there. So it's okay to send another email with a different subject heading or forward the same email and change the subject heading saying that I'm writing to you again. Nothing to lose, okay? Never give up. So with the third in the, the slide I have here is how do you embed yourself in research cult in Sri Lanka or far away? It doesn't matter where you do it. So you have to do your homework, okay? If you come to um, Australia, if you come to University of Melbourne where I work, the cost of recruiting a PhD student is this much, $265,000. So the question is, what is expected of you, okay? Why do they invest this much money in you, right? And so prepare yourself to be that, that person, okay? So it's important to understand this, understand the, this, the scenario. Talk to your dedicated senior researchers in your Sri Lankan university and seek their views. And talking to younger staff who have done their PhDs recently and came back to Sri Lanka or, or did the, you know, the PhD in Sri Lanka itself, talk to them. It's important because they have the most recent experience about the PhDs. PhDs do not stay the same. It, it changes. In five years, if a student comes to me and this person will be doing a different PhD than today, it changes so rapidly. The way it is done, the tools available and expectations, everything changes, okay? So talk to them. Read research papers with high citations or high field weighted citation indexes and attempt to do some research inspired by those papers. I have seen people doing it, okay? So people actually do this stuff before they contact us. They say, we took uh, these research papers and we did this nice little thing. So what do you think about it? So I'm more interested then, okay? So there are no excuses in, in technology, engineering, computer science, and also physics, maths, and so on. The areas that I am talking about. Archive.com, papers are free. Google Scholar, you have access. So develop yourself to be a critical person. That is the opposite of always being a yes sir, yes madam person doesn't mean that you, you, you don't have to be polite. You still have to be polite to your teachers, but you do not have to agree with them all the time, okay? Be a formidable detective. That is essential if you want to do research because you do not agree with the current state of affairs because you want to question them and you want to find new things. So that is so much important attribute to have if you want to do research. Improve your communication skills. This is not about English. This is beyond learning a language. My rule of thumb is, I ask, are you good in Sinhala or Tamil or whatever the language you speak? So I ask the same question from other students. If you're good in your mother tongue, excellent in your mother tongue, I think it is a good sign that you will be good in, in this communication thing related to research. Okay. So now I'm going towards the last couple of slides and this is my last detailed slide, I hope. And my notes as an expect, my experience, I work with smart students, absolutely super smart students and good administrators. I work with UGC, Minister of Health, Minister of Higher Education, several VCs teams, just good people in academics, wonderful people. You do have excellent people, okay? 
And some sharp politicians also say, although I like to avoid them, okay? And I think a few days ago, I wrote to an MP in Sri Lankan parliament, quick text or not text, actually message. And I got a reply within hours. And then I wanted a, something, a document. And that document came today, okay, on email. So it's, it's very different. You have to look for them. There, some of them are very sharp. Okay, so now, sorry, I haven't finished it. What can we do as expects? We listen, understand, and appreciate, okay? It's an unequal playing field. My colleagues at, at Sri Lankan universities tell me, not enough research funds, not enough good local students willing to do PhDs. Research culture, culture is not that great. Politics, politics, politics. Well, I ask myself, why do all these sound familiar? Do you think we have a level playing field? Sorry for spelling mistakes here. So do we have a you know, level playing field? No, it's not a fair world, but we have to work out a strategy, right? We shouldn't give up. We have to work out a strategy. We do that and you have to do that too. Support, 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 support academic staff, Invite staff as examiners of PhD thesis conducted in good universities. I have started doing it, but of course, if my student is from Moratu University, I cannot send this person's PhD thesis for examination to my colleague at Moratu University. Then, but I can go to Columbia University or Rohuna, right? So you have to be careful, and you cannot um, go against laws. And I cannot also send it to someone I collaborate with, but I can. Pick someone whom I do not know, but good enough to be an examiner, because that person then gets the experience in examining the PhD thesis conducted in my group. So that's something new I have started doing. Not new, but um, it's probably not many people can do that. Offer sabbatical position, join PhD supervision. Well, my colleagues will talk about that too. Support students in Sri Lanka with information training. I do that. I usually answer all, all the questions people ask from me. But of course, I mean, if there are a million questions, I can only answer 100. Okay. But I usually do that. Support institutions, organizations, relevant ministries. Okay. Because they can make a change. And I do that too. So this is the sort of the last slide and I'm out of my time. So these are the five out of 20 PhD students I trained in my group, 20, sorry, 20 Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan students. I had about, I trained about 50 and close to half of them are from Sri Lanka and five of them went back to Sri Lanka because they came, when they came, some of them were already staff. So two in Peradeni engineering faculty, two in Moratua engineering faculty and one person in Ruhuna computer science department. Um, so interesting, I put their names here. So, um, and these are the current students and um, these top three are postdocs. That means they are, they finished their PhD. Um, Rajit has just submitted and, um, but all got jobs and, um, and there are four students still doing their PhDs and there's another person uh, joining. Uh, in October and starting virtually in Sri Lanka. So it's possible to start there virtually and then come back, come to, to Australia when um, travel is relaxed. And then there are three very top students um, um, in, in the list, um, waiting list to get scholarships. And we do other things than work. So this is the, um, you know, um, the new year. The, in April, so we had uh, all New Year festivals and all the games and in the university, inside the university. So you can see that here. So we have a music concert every year and from the organized by the Sri Lankan Graduates Society in the University of Melbourne. So my postdoc is um, playing here. And we also go to, you know, lunches and dinners and celebrate each other's success. So it's not just work all the time. Thank you very much. I stop here and happy to um, answer any questions as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your informative presentation. 
your presentation shed light on what uh, Sri Lankan uh, has to do in uh, enhancing the global presence of the scholarly publications, then our younger researchers could uh, harness opportunities uh, if they want to harness the opportunity, how they should proceed. So thank you very much. Next item is, I cordially invite Professor Danture Vikramasinghe. Come here. Adam Smith Come here. Business School, University of Glasgow, UK. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Shanta. And thank you very much, Professor Ranjit Senaratna, my good old friend from Rupna University, for inviting me to join this session, this wonderful session in a summer afternoon in the UK. I'm very much impressed by this platform, digital platform. I also have a PhD student who is also studying a platform organization in this globalized, digitalized, financialized world. Many organizations are now becoming platform organizations. My PhD student from China has studied Chinese Didi. That is the Chinese version of Uber taxis. She spent six months as a taxi driver in Didi's to understand how that particular platform organization has been regulating, has been governing, has been calculating, has been measuring the performance of those drivers in order to understand how such platform technologies are now making people, making individuals accountable. So she is the final year PhD student now. She is using a sociological perspective to theorize this particular phenomenon in order to get some publications in the future. What I said is that world is now, organizations are now being extended to or being transformed into platforms. Hence, NSF is exploiting this wonderful opportunity to gather people like us to join you, to share our experiences, our ideas, etc., in this wonderful UK afternoon. As you see here, I'm an academic accountant. I see accounting as a social science. I understand how accounting is shaped by us and how accounting also shapes us in organizations, in societies, in political arenas, in globalized alliances. To do that, I take broad social science perspective. Therefore, I am mainly speaking to social scientists here, but I'm sure non-social scientists our friendly pure scientist may hear me. By social sciences, we mean a particular ideology, a particular set of 
interlocking ideas which explains the world where we live. As an academic accountant, taking a social science perspective, I mainly follow the writers such as sociologists and political theorists. Unlike many other social scientists, I use ethnographic methods broadly defined in order to theorize the social. In doing that, we are, as social scientists, try to explore big questions. How are we institutionalized? How are we established as a society? How are we organized as people? That's a big sociological question or social science question. What are the underlying conditions in this process of institutionalization or deinstitutionalization and reinstitutionalization. Sorry, I'm using that language, language of social scientists. And how can we explain these things? Because prime responsibility of social science researchers is to explain the social world, not to provide recommendations to solve practical problems. That is the consultant's job, or that is the policymaker's job, or that is the politician's job. But as academics, we explain something theoretically to make a tiny, a tiny incremental contribution to an existing debate. That is what social scientists do. I am in the faculty of social sciences at the University of Glasgow a very old university. It was founded in 1451, 600, over 600 years ago. Father of economics, Adam Smith, worked here in the 18th century. When he was writing these sentiments, moral sentiments, then the wealth of nations, he was in Glasgow. In our faculty, we have several schools. Our university is a collegial university like Oxford, Cambridge. Therefore, our faculty is called College of Social Sciences. And I am in the Adam Smith Business School one of six schools in the College of Social Sciences. Unlike in Sri Lanka, we don't have management faculties. We are all in social science faculties because management is a social science. Yes, definitely a social science. In Sri Lanka, education is hierarchically organized. Science faculties are better than management faculties, and management faculties are better than arts faculties. So it is not the case here in the UK. We are all social scientists. Be a management researcher, be an accounting researcher. In our faculty, in 2021, we have recognized these five themes as emerging, significant, 
important research themes, not research topics, research themes. Sustainability, if you are an accounting academic, you can study sustainability. If you are an economics student, you can study sustainability. If you are a historian, still you can study sustainability. Issues of sustainability, how the discourse of sustainability governs us now around the world. Sustainability idea, sustainability discourse is everywhere. And addressing inequality. We are now in an extended capitalist world, which is known as a neoliberal world, which continuously produces social inequalities, as social scientists argue. Therefore, we are trying to address these things from various perspectives by using variety of technologies and ideas, such as corporate governance, again, sustainability, again, risk management, etc. Digital society and economy, another theme. We are now digitalized. We are now digitalized animals. We are hacked by digital technologies. So sometimes we can't write by our long hand because our hands have been hacked by digital technologies. And economies are being invaded by this digital technology. Therefore, from a variety of disciplines, you can find various research topics to understand variety of issues and phenomena. And cities are now being transformed through digital technologies. Now you don't need to go to city offices. Instead, officers are coming to you. Officers are on your palm. People can interact with these cities through digital technologies again. <clears throat> and as a result, social scientists are now talking about the issues of justice, our social security, and the status of decision-making, exploring whether we are doing our bit for fair decision-making. Whatever the discipline you are in, be it management, be it accounting, be it economics, be it sociology, be it anthropology, be it political science, be it history, you can address these emerging themes. These are our research themes. These are our research priorities. Therefore, our college is being strategized, being strategized because strategy is not a static thing now. Strategy is strategizing, it is being strategized. We are being strategized in order to capture, in order to conduct variety of research projects under these big themes. So in order to do that, social scientists follow the processes of knowledge production by doing research projects, by getting papers published, 
by presenting at conferences, by writing academic books, we are continuously produce knowledge. And this entails a particular process, process of knowledge production. Social scientists mainly nowadays have three alternative routes. One is Karl Popperian, Karl Popperian, hypothetical deductive methodology, which is mainly based on quantitative techniques for the purpose of hypothesis testing in the hope of falsifying, in the hope of falsifying existing big ideas. They think that knowledge can be produced, knowledge can be extended through the process of falsification. Second thing is empirical inductive methodology, which I love. We think that rather than following quantitative techniques in the hope of falsification, we believe in that is called epistemology, way of knowing, science of knowing through interpretations, critical interpretations through critical inquiries, by using broader social science lenses. That is why I follow ethnographic methods. My PhD student I mentioned at the beginning, the Chinese girl did that ethnographic study living six months with taxi drivers, of course, with her father as well, in order to get herself protected. That's an ethnography. And we believe that knowledge can be produced through sociological imagination, sociological interpretation for a critical inquiry. Or alternatively, we can follow historiographies where we produce knowledge by writing and rewriting history from alternative, different perspectives. One of the things I must mention here over this slide. I'm the program director in PhD in accounting and finance at the Adam Smith Business School here in Glasgow. I'm the person who reads hundreds of PhD proposals every week coming from various countries around the world. <clears throat> when I got get an application from Asia or from the Middle East, 99% it is sure. It is a quantitative research proposal in the hope of testing certain hypotheses and there are no alternatives, which I call the methodology. <laughs> in many social scientists in those countries think that 
the methodology is the methodology given by the god and some universities i know some eastern asian universities for example they have university bylaws regulations emphasizing the fact that the methodology is hypothesis testing but in the west in europe and in some or many australian and new zealand universities in the social sciences i know accounting departments business schools they are working beyond the methodology in order to understand the social through interpretations for critical inquiries from the lenses of social sciences in order to produce interdisciplinary research for example if you want to have a publication with a medical researcher still you could actually take a sociological perspective for example in the pandemic time now you can get a collaboration with a medical or so biological person to understand how pandemic is being governed not only through medical technologies biological technologies but also other political governing mechanisms which are differently organized which are being differently institutionalized in different countries for example recently we quickly published a paper exploring how south korea managed to stop pandemic at a particular time using big data analytics which is a technology through the democratically institutionalized governing mechanism in the country <laughs> but we use anthropological ethnographical qualitative methods in many good universities in the west in the social sciences many accounting students in my department for example do qualitative ethnographic case studies while using sociological anthropological perspectives in order to explain in order to theorize their findings and as researchers we are governed by a government institution a government system which is called ref research excellent framework every five year we need to submit up to five research outputs for this government's review this government's examination ref exercise then we get rated we get commented and based on the evaluation they do we get research funding from the government therefore we all are engaged we all are busy producing high quality research according to the ref 
research excellent framework in the UK that applies to all sciences. Quality means originality, significance, and rigor. Can you get a paper published? The findings must be original. The argument must be original. The analysis must be original. The message must be original. Compared to previous studies in the chosen stream of research. And it must be significant, significant to our time now. For example, in the pandemic world or in the post pandemic world, under the new normal. <laughs> We may address most significant questions in order to see how our future world can be reorganized, can be reinstitutionalized according to the rules of the game permeated by the pandemic experience. Therefore, in many senses, in many, in every sense, your research must be significant. Significant to the area, significant to the practice, significant to the policy, significant to our time now. And it must be rigorous. The methodology, the ontological assumptions, the epistemological strategies must be by all means rigorous. When we review papers for journals, we see whether this is rigorous. Hence, quality is not just a jargon. It is a practice to be operationalized. It is a practice to be judged. It is a practice to be evaluated in terms of originality, significance, and rigor. <laughs> As the organizers of this webinar ask us to show, share with you how we could help you. As expected, how we can be impacted through this technology of platform organization digital platform. When I come to Sri Lanka, I always get invitations from various universities to give some seminars, workshops, presentations. One of the things I did, I think, some years back at the University of Colombo, where I also worked before, on how to write a research proposal. How to write a pro research proposal for a social science research project. I know I am the person who accepts or rejects research proposals here in Glasgow in the business school for accounting and finance PhDs. I always, always, not often, I always, always reject applications because the proposals are very weak. 
proposals are very weak. Some people assume that PhD is to or social science PhD is to introduce a new practice, introduce a new model for policy, provide some recommendations to solve some problems. That is a real misunderstanding. Look at top class journals in the social sciences. American Sociological Review, Economy and Society, Accounting Organizations and Society, Critical Perspectives on Accounting, organization studies, they don't end up with recommendations. They instead address an important, significant questions through a process, through a rigorous process in order to produce something original. <laughs> ending up with a better, significant conclusion. When I get research proposals with those hopes of recommendations, I reject them. And also they don't know the language in which social science research proposals must be written. Excuse me, Professor. Yes? How many more minutes do you need? We are running a little behind time. All right, okay. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop in two minutes. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, Professor, very much. Okay, thanks, Ranjit. Therefore, I can help you developing research proposals, and also finding PhD scholarships. For example, recently I arranged a scholarship for a young academic from Java Dinapura University to do a PhD with me at Glasgow. And also I can help you do interdisciplinary journal publications with other scientists, other social scientists from other departments. <laughs> and we can in, get ourselves involved in symposiums, workshops, organized on emerging issues. <laughs> and also, we can create reading groups I have also created a reading groups among some academics in, in Sri Lanka now. And we meet fortnightly and read and discuss something. And social scientist lab is writing. We could actually create writing surgeries in order to enhance their writing skills. So this is a shopping list. We can discuss that. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop here in the hope of answering your questions. Thank you very much, sir, for shedding lights on social science dimension to the research, uh, research agenda. So you enlighten the how to win, uh, write a winning proposal and what are the new uh, methodologies of doing research in any discipline. Uh, in uh, a part, I mean, the material of the discipline, how you bring the social science dimension to every discipline. Thank you very much. And next item is a speech from Professor D. 
Dilanta Fernando. Uh, he is from Department of Plant Science, University of Manitoba, Canada. Over to you, Professor Dilanta. Good evening. Thank you, Shanta. Professor Ranjit Senaratna, thank you for inviting me for this uh, very important uh, digital platform webinar. Uh, welcome, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning to some of you. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be uh, with uh, all of you from Sri Lanka in this uh, um, presentation that I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to share my slides and then hopefully we can get started. There you go. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to make sure that I can see everything. Yeah, so, uh, so today you have already heard from someone and uh, uh, Professor Dantre uh, about how Sri Lanka can advance in uh, sciences um, and uh, make an impact. Now, my presentation is fairly similar, but I am touching on a few other things. So I'm more particularly touching Manito on the science. Dean. Um, Please unmute others' mics, audience mics. Please unmute. Uh, please mute all the audience mics. Let speaker only speak, please. Uh, Professor Professor Dilanta, you have uh, you need to un un unmute the mic. Oh, right, okay. Right. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much again. I hope you can hear. Uh, so my presentation is going to be on the science and technology advancements for food security and environmental sustainability, something that is being spoken of very often today in Sri Lanka. So uh, I'm pretty sure you will have questions and uh, my presentation will make sense uh, as, you, as I move along. So um, just wanted to give you a, a snapshot of where I started. Uh, I started my um, university career uh, at the University of Peradeniya in Sri Lanka. As Professor Saman mentioned, we all got a, a great education, uh, thanks to my, most of our professors and mentors. And I should thank them profusely because that particular education took us to where we are today of course our parents, and of course the colleges that we went to. But uh, the university education, which was a free education, and what I wanted to uh, emphasize here as someone did, is that we want to give back, give back to Sri Lanka. And I'm already doing that, but at the same time with this digital platform, there's an opportunity to be doing it more. Now, I just wanted to also show you what I looked like at that time. Uh, so I had a lot of hair. Um, uh, I looked much younger than what I am today, but um, that's my beginnings. And today I am at the oldest Western University in Canada. That's the University of Manitoba. So it's surrounded by a beautiful river. You might have heard the song, the Red River Valley song. So we are in the Red River Valley. And uh, uh, the university has about 35,000 students, undergraduate and graduate. About 30%, uh, I would say, might be international students as well. And that's what I look like today um, with no hair um, <laughs> and getting old. I also wanted to take this opportunity in thanking all my pro, uh, uh, graduate students and um, postdocs, research associates, technicians, but in particular for this presentation, I wanted to thank the graduate students from Sri Lanka. Without their work, without what they have done, my success story would not be a success story. So I always attribute my uh, success to the work that graduate students do. 
And that's why, as Saman and Dan mentioned, we are looking for the best. We are looking for the best to be brought to our labs so that uh, they gain an experience, but also we get a lot of good work done and good publications. So Chami uh, Amrasinghe, Sarang Yatukoral, uh, Professor Saman Abhisinga came as a visiting scientist to my lab. Uh, Rasani Padmatilaka is a PhD student at the moment. Uh, Sachitrani, Arshani, and Anuradha, they are all master students at the moment. And um, um, in uh, 2022, April, Vinuri Veerasinga will be joining uh, my lab. Uh, so again, you can see that we do try to uh, attract the best, and we try to do that early so that uh, we we, we uh, coordinate and collaborate with that particular student much before they come here so that they are aware of what they are going to do and how they are going to um, uh, contribute to the program. Now, as I said, I wanted to touch on how to succeed in research. So, I, th I think there are three main points that I wanted to make. By working towards a need, that's number one. By working towards a goal, that's number two. And for working for food, culture, and the health. So you have to bridge and think about all these at the same time. Otherwise, if you are thinking only about productivity, you might neglect the environment. So you have to really think about all this when you are thinking about research. Now, one of the main uh, success stories of the University of Manitoba, there are many, but I wanted to touch no, something, something in agriculture. I would... Uh, Ask uh, people who are not muted to please mute yourself because it's disturbing the presentation. Can you please mute yourself, please? So um, one of the biggest success stories, which is right now yearly bringing about 30 billion Canadian dollars to the Canadian economy is the canola crop. So it's the number one cash crop. It's not wheat, it's not barley anymore. It's the canola crop because it's the most desired edible oil in the market in the world. And the father of canola is from my department uh, at the University of Manitoba, uh, plant science, Professor Baldur Stephenson. Unfortunately, he has passed away, but uh, he was the father of canola who developed uh, uh, the canola crop. The name canola comes from Canada plus oil, uh, that is, um, uh, which was developed for the first time in Canada at the University of Manitoba, but now it's a global crop. And uh, the reason for this uh, to be so important is because uh, the work that I do uh, with the breeders in pre-breeding and breeding, uh, breeding for disease resistance is so important for the crop to get to the market or to the grower. So um, the Canadian government um, um, recognized the contributions that we had done and um, came up uh, with a, a Canadian stamp uh, for commemorating uh, some of the excellent work done by the Canola Group at the University of Manitoba. So why is canola so important? You can see, I'll just only mention about the most important part. It's very low in the saturates. So it's good for your health. And also it's really good in the monounsaturated uh, fatty acids that are good for your health. So this is part of the reason that uh, the canola industry has become extremely uh, uh, important in Canada. And um, one of the things that, as I said about the need and the goal, you have to also think about when you do research, data should move to recommendations to use on the farm. So um, the um, uh, uh, I'm using a quote from uh, Dr. Rob Fraley, uh, who uh, gave a talk at Grow Canada in 2017. He was a World Food Prize winner, Biotechnology Heritage Award winner, and National uh, Medal of Technology 
uh, uh, winner. Uh, he was the former executive vice president and chief technology officer at Monsanto before he retired. Uh, he always believed in data by itself is useless unless you can turn it into recommendations to use on the farm. So we have heard a lot about publications, but I will go beyond the publication part Publications are very important and uh, high impact is very important. But beyond that, you have to have an impact on the work that you do in the uh, uh, for the people that you work. And in my case, it is uh, to the growers, uh, agriculture uh, sector, so that has to reach. Now, also, as I said, the goals and the needs have to be met according to what you want in your particular country. For example, Canada. Canada has a population of 37 million. It's the second largest country in the world. And therefore, we have lots and lots of acreage to grow crops. So most of the crops that we grow, at least 65 to 70 percent go out of Canada because that is for the export market that we uh, uh, grow most of it. Did you know that the red lentil or paripo that you eat comes from Canada? Uh, from Saskatchewan mainly, uh, the uh, adjoining province to Manitoba? You may not have known. You might have thought that it is Mysore Dal, but most of these uh, is packaged back in India and sold to um, Sri Lanka, but they are originating from Canada. So the quality, uh, if you are getting quality red lentils, that's from Canada. And there are Sri Lankan scientists who are working tirelessly uh, in that industry in Saskatchewan. So when we look for the... Uh, export market, we have to make sure that it is a perfect product. The perfect product part comes again with the need and the goal. So you're exporting oil, seed and meal to markets around the world. They have certain uh, requests that it has to be free of pesticides, free, free of many other things. So you have to meet all that. Now, a good another example of the need and the goal is when uh, one of the major diseases that I work on, uh, canola's black leg disease, which is highlighted here, how the black leg is rated and how the yield can drop from a very healthy crop to almost none, um, has also become a huge trade issue with China because China doesn't have the black leg, but they grow as much as uh, Canada, uh, in the uh, they have a canola industry that is very robust. So they don't want to introduce a pathogen that is not in uh, um, China. So they, have, for various other reasons as well, they have put an embargo on the canola uh, going to China. So the person that goes to China to talk about the importance of canola still moving to China is not me, but our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who is here. Now, what is he carrying? He's carrying reports that are um, prepared by research, through research, from my lab. I, my lab was identified as the lead lab to do this research for Canada at a very, in a very sensitive um, time because the loss to Canada was $3 billion and we had to make sure that $3 billion was going to be brought back to the Canadian economy. And to do that, uh, our Canadian prime minister has been to China many times. The previous prime minister, Stephen Harper, has done the same with the agriculture minister and the trade minister and the foreign minister. So uh, at a level, there's diplomatic talks, but also with a scientific background that is done through the research that we do. So market access for Canada is so important. So one day, I would really want to see Sri Lanka talking about market access, not uh, um, importing, but getting to the market access, like what we have done in tea, rubber, and coconut to get into other crops as well. So how do you achieve your goals? Now, uh, there are many ways that you can achieve your goals, but these are the primary principles that I follow. I first come up with a sound hypothesis, and then I develop a particular proposal to get funding, and then have the right tools to work. 
and identify what your lab cannot do. That is a very important part in training graduate students. Some of my graduate students are trained also in other labs. Why? Because some of the things that they need to do to achieve the research goals and needs that I have set for them, they need that extra uh, opportunity in a different lab. So collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. This is so important. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is it is a high, it is high time that Sri Lankan universities collaborate within Sri Lankan universities, between different groups, different universities, different uh, uh, departments, all that has to happen to be successful. So that would uh, be achieving your goals and success. So to get to those goals, how do you, so for example, in agriculture, the primary thing that comes to your mind is, how do you increase yield? Of course, you have to have productivity and then also profit. Profit to the grower, profit to the middleman and profit to the country. Now, those all those have to be done with principles of health, ecology, fairness and care in mind. If you lose any one of them, then we are not doing the right thing for the country. We are not doing the right thing, right thing for the people. So when you do all that, think about it. It's difficult. It's not easy science because you are looking at all these factors, bringing them together. So one of the major stressors that plants go through is biotic and abiotic stress. And resilience to the stressors is an important part of research. So I think there has to be a more expanded level of research done uh, on these factors. How do you manage pests and diseases in a sustainable way? Most of the work that I do is on genetics, understanding the genetics of pathogens, understanding the genetics of the hosts, and bringing those two together in the pre-breeding programs for, and for our training students to identify how best we can achieve our goals. I will uh, end my presentation um, uh, later with an example, fine example of how we have changed the agricultural framework and agricultural sphere in Canada with a simple amount of research that was done in my lab. So sustainable agricultural intensification is so important. How do you protect the environment and biodiversity while increasing the yield? Just if you think about only the increase of yield, you are not going to sustain your environment and the biodiversity. Microbial uh, biodiversity is so important. The food web is so important. And finally, here I wanted to mention just by itself, genetics do not work. Genetics works with the environment. So there are many uh, environmental factors, including with climate change, that will be changing that you might need to address in the framework of genetics to improve crops for the future. Now, as most of us are talking in Sri Lanka today, I watch Sri Lankan news. I always see that there's a, the need of the hour is food security. Land is not increasing in Sri Lanka. Actually, it is decreasing. Now, this is not only in Sri Lanka. It is happening all over the world. And climate change is happening all over the world. Today, um, just in Manitoba, the uh, temperature is going to be 32 degrees centigrade. And um, in one city in British Columbia, which, is, which generally has very uh, moderate temperatures, it's going to hit 47 uh, centigrade on um, uh, Sunday. So you can see that there's definitely certain changes that are happening, and we have to address our crops to that. Some, it is a gain. For example, Manitoba, it's a gain because if with warmer temperatures and longer um, uh, uh, growth periods, we are in for other crops like soybeans, uh, um, corn and other crops that we did not grow in uh, Manitoba to be grown. The same is true for Sri Lanka. There might be certain uh, uh, changes in the climate that might allow you to bring certain crops. So don't 
always think about the same crop, same uh, thing that you can grow. You have to look at other opportunities. Lentils, I, I spoke about earlier that Saskatchewan brings lentils to Sri Lanka. How about growing uh, lentils in Sri Lanka? Because that's almost like a staple food. I cannot have my food without uh, uh, without uh, 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 the uh, paripukari, and that 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 is something that is kind of embedded in our lifestyle. So uh, I hear I heard that the Sri Lankans have there are certain areas that have been identified that lentils can be grown, and they are doing well. And I think those are the things that the science foundations agriculture department and all should put more weight and uh, make it uh, a success. Marriage of science. Agriculture doesn't work by itself. You have to bridge biology. I am from the Faculty of Science. I did a botany honors degree uh, in Peradeniya. I didn't do agriculture, but I'm completely immersed in agriculture today. Why? Because I have bridged that uh, gap on biology and brought that together. Now talking about the technologies, I'm not going to talk about any of these in detail. I just wanted to highlight what is available for you today that was not available during my time as a PhD student. So if you are thinking of a PhD program, all this is available and all this is done in my lab as well. Genotyping, phenotyping, high throughput sequencing, the omics approaches of transcriptomics, proteomics, genomics, and metabolomics. One thing that we are not able to do, and I'm never going to be a, a person who can do, is machine learning. Like Professor Saman is an expert in machine learning. Now, how do I get that? By collaborating with someone to do my genomic prediction. So artificial intelligence can be now used for genomic prediction. And I'm using that. And my, two of my students are um, doing that uh, research. And I have already sent a paper to Professor Saman to review it uh, before we send it for publication because he's an expert in that area. Now, some of the things that we do very well is gene editing in our lab. Uh, we use CRISPR-Cas9 system. And uh, some of my Sri Lankan students are also doing a CRISPR-Cas9. RNAi technology, the sequence-specific suppression of gene expression. These are two tools that are so important in uh, changing the way that we look at uh, disease suppression, uh, controlling diseases without fungicides. So we, we cannot be relying on the inorganic uh, chemicals all along. We have to change our way of thinking, way of thinking with the new technologies at hand. And if you get this training and if you go back to Sri Lanka, I think what the Sri Lankan government, the university should do is give you a very good position so that you run these uh, op opportunities for Sri Lanka for the uh, benefit of the younger generation. And uh, robotics are becoming more and more useful in the research that we do. So I just touch on um, some of the work that you can do with the CRISPR editing. You can knock out uh, certain areas of a gene uh, that might be uh, the reason for a particular disease, either in a human disease or a plant disease. We do mainly for understanding how diseases happen, but you can purely edit genes so that you can get a new crop with uh, uh, no disease because there is then going to be disease resistance to that. So finally, I wanted to end my presentation with another success story. As I started with a success story of the University of Manitoba, I wanted to end my uh, presentation with a success story that came right from my lab. We introduced what is called our gene rotations, that is resistance genes rotations to overcome pathogen populations in Canada. Now, this is a new concept. This was embraced by the industry, embraced by the agricultural sector in Canada. And now since 2017, it is a practice. So we are very proud, as I said, I'm very proud of my graduate students and postdocs who have worked 
tirelessly to do what I want, why, what I had as a vision. So this RJ labeling system came along because of that. So all the canola varieties that are grown, most of the canola varieties that are grown now have a label with the R gene that we identify. How did this come about? As I told earlier, the goal and the need. So in 2010, we identified that the resistance in canola varieties to blackleg was breaking down. And that's the same time that China was imposing a $3 billion ban of our seed going to China. So it was perfect timing for us to look at the, uh, have a vision and look at the future with goals. So to, to do that, one of my PhD students from China, uh, Shu Hua Zhang, worked tirelessly. Actually, she worked sometimes 18 uh, uh, hours, she said, to get what she wanted on a particular day. So, uh, so uh, what she found was she was able to characterize all the uh, varieties that were grown, about 116 varieties that were grown or developed in Canada, she was able to identify the uh, resistance gene and characterize them to the type of resistance genes that they carry. At the same time, another student in my lab, a master student, Sakurai Aliban, was looking at the pathogen population. And what he saw was that um, the pathogen population had more virulent isolates of the uh, AVRLM3. Uh, and the RLM3 here uh, was breaking down because there was more pathogen populations of the virulent isolates. So all this is done by molecular techniques, uh, phenotyping, genotyping. So that's why these are so important. So once they, once these students brought their research together, so I was talking about collaboration outside. Here's collaboration within the lab. So you don't work in isolation. You work with your other um, colleagues, your friends to get to what you want. And because of this uh, uh, marriage of science between these two students, we were able to bring out this wonderful new technology of our gene rotations to be now implemented in Canada. So what we did was to simplify for the farmer when they are buying the product, we call them in groups what these resistance genes are. We just called A, B, C, D, E for them to remember easily. And since uh, this first finding, the industry, 95% uh, of the canola development is done through uh, uh, seed companies like Bear Crop Science, uh, Cargill, uh, BASF, uh, there are many companies, and they have introduced new RLM genes to the Canadian canola because they were excited about what we had found. And they were excited when we gave the message on the R gene rotation that they knew that they had to do something to get new R genes into the um, uh, uh, breeding programs and introduce them into their varieties. So now we are in a position to rotate these uh, genes. So if you have had a 2020 last year, a particular group of uh, R gene, please don't grow that. You grow a different R gene so that you don't have that disease in the field anymore. So this is the new concept. You So we work with the growers, we work with the industry, and we work with the Canadian government to achieve these goals. So with to do that, one, one of the things that you might, if you are a plant pathologist, might ask is, so how is the farmer going to know? To do that, one of my postdocs developed what is called CAS markers to clearly identify avirulence genes uh, from virulence genes. So once you have that technology in place, we, saw, we gave it to uh, um, seed testing laboratories where a grower can send in their samples that are deceased and identify what particular pathogen population or races that particular field carries. And with that, they will be able to tell the um, company what seed they would want with group A or group B and so on. So it is so important that you work with government, industry, growers, and consumers. All together, everybody has to come together to make it a success story. So if you are sitting in your um, uh, university and thinking that everybody has to believe in you, it's not going to happen. You have to get out to the field, get to the dirt, 
get working, get to uh, the industry, talk to the industry, talk to the government, talk to growers, go to the growers. How many uh, are doing that? I, I, I challenge you to do that and you will see the uh, change in your own research because that's the only way that you can get. Uh, and you have to do real experiments in the field to show showcase farmers of what you talk about. So here's the same gene on the same uh, pathogen stubble from last year. And this is what happens. Right adjoining, you can have a new R gene uh, from a different group on the same old stubble from the previous year and get a very healthy, excellent crop. So this is uh, for demonstration. We do that uh, for the farmers to come and see it. They see it with their own eyes and then they believe it and then they go and do it in their own fields. So this is the strategy that we use from our uh, lab uh, to the field. So I started by saying just data and publications doesn't make the cut for me. I want that to happen to the people that matter, the people that are putting money into the research, that they are trusting your research, what will bring out. So here's another fine example where the uh, two varieties with the same R gene is grown in the same field. One completely diseased because it is carrying only one gene and the other almost 100% uh, clean because it's carrying two genes. So RLM4 is actually uh, saving the uh, brunt of the RLM3 falling apart because of the pathogen population. So these are good examples of how we do it. Actually, this work was done through the pandemic. You can see the date, September 23, 2020. So I would like to end with again mentioning that data by itself is useless. Useless if you cannot turn it into recommendations to use on the farm. So I'm a firm believer on that and I work towards that and moving the recommendations to use on the farm. This is the most important message that I hope I can give in the present context of what, is, what Sri Lanka is going through. If we as scientists talk a lot, criticize a lot of others' research or others', others statements and do nothing, it's not going to help. It is so important that you really do what you are supposed to do and then uh, uh, provide that uh, basis for the country. Now, how do you get funding for research? Now, this is going to be controversial when I say this. The federal government has a real role to play and they have to take interest. If the National Science Foundation is the arm of the federal government to give funding, yes, that has to be increased. Pradesia Sabha and provincial funding has to come along. Why? Because there are certain areas in Sri Lanka provinces that are thriving in the agricultural industry. Certain areas are thriving in the auto industry. Why not put money uh, for that purpose from the province and grow organizations. Now, this is something that might be new to hear for you to hear. Grow organizations, how can they put money? Individual growers may not be easily able to put money. In Canada, US, and many other countries, about five to 10 cents per bushel goes into a research pot. And that immediately comes to about a million dollars or sometimes $10 million. And that's the research money that is then given to re successful researchers to do research. So I have been able to attract 35 million to 38 million um, Canadian dollars for my research. Each year, uh, my uh, bench research uh, with the student um, uh, stipends and everything is about 1 million. So all that is because the growers believe in what you do. And then private industry. Seed companies make a lot of money. There are many uh, private companies in Sri Lanka. Why don't they put the money into active research? Why is grow organizations not particularly formed? But we already talk about certain individuals as mafia. We say Sahal mafia. And they are millionaires. They are buying jets, but they are not putting a cent into the research. So they are 
exploiting the poor farmer. They are not putting the money and they are gaining the benefits only to themselves. This has to change in Sri Lanka. I'm sorry to say, but I had to say it because I think we have to think differently in how we uh, uh, move forward. Govern so in uh, the, um, the last two slides, I want to emphasize how we can enhance the cooperation on research. So government to government agreements uh, and funding and um, material transfer agreements have to be signed. I have several different countries signing agreements between Canada and uh, China, Canada and Germany, Canada and US, and then with the university and then with my department and then with myself uh, to do some of this research. The same has to happen with Sri Lankan government, now talking to the Canadian government. Who is going to lead this? It is the responsibility of the Canadian consulate, that is the Sri Lankan High Commissioner sitting in Ottawa to do some of this, because they are here to promote Sri Lanka. And to promote Sri Lanka, they have to do some work when they come here. And this hybrid university, appointments uh, for expatriates is a new thing that is highly, highly successful in China and a few other countries in New Zealand, where um, people who have now, let's say, for example, I am at the University of Manitoba, but I also have a cross appointment at a University of Colombo or University of Peradenia, not as an adjunct professor, but a real uh, cross appointment where I can bring um, funding to Sri Lanka to do research or gain some research funding from the National Science Foundation to do research for the Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka. So this hybrid system is working very well for Chinese. That's partly the reason that they are now publishing in journals like Science, Nature, Nature Communications, because they have that uh, collaborative approach with the hybrid system that they have developed. And uh, bring different disciplines together so important. As I said, if I, if I am going to work in isolation, I'm not going to be successful. And writing proposals for funding is so important, as Dan mentioned. And thank you, Dan, for mentioning that, because writing a good proposal is the way to the funding. And that has to be written as a story, not purely on the science basis. If you write just science jargon, you don't know who's going to be looking at the proposal and the person who's looking at the proposal may not be uh, understanding what you wrote. So it has to be a story with, uh, of course, a value of how it is going to be done. So my parting thoughts on collaboration with high inst uh, educational institutes in Sri Lanka is, I would love to, like what I'm already doing, but to expand the work with these higher education uh, institutes and researchers, train uh, more graduate students and postdocs, if I can, from Sri Lanka. I would invite people to think about sabbatical leaves um, uh, to and from, of course. So I should be thinking of some of my sabbatical leaves, which actually I've done. I've gone back to Sri Lanka. I have uh, uh, really enjoyed the, those opportunities and exchange programs, and then lectures, seminars, and mutual discussions through the uh, digital platform that we have. As uh, Professor Saman mentioned, everything is not work, everything is not science, we have our fun times as well. So this is a picture of one of my students, Rasani, winning one of the top awards in, uh, in Canada uh, for the research that she's doing. Uh, here I'm enjoying with my um, young uh, graduate students uh, enjoying uh, the New Year's celebration in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, of the New Year's Eve, but uh, in Sri Lankan style with the Sri Lankan uh, band playing and dancing. Um, me enjoying with my graduate PhD graduate student, a nice cool beer and enjoying my dinner with uh, my graduate students and postdocs uh, at a uh, restaurant. So, uh, with that, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to take a, a, a group picture of 2020 because of the pandemic. So the um, what I have is from 2019. So you have two students, uh, Sri Lankan students here, uh, Sachitrani and Rasani here. But you can also see the mixture. They are from all over the world. 
Why? When you have an attractive research program, you attract the best from the world. So he's from China. He's from Nigeria, Canada. She's my technician, PhD student from Canada, um, undergraduate students from Canada, China, um, uh, China, China, um, Philippines, and here's myself. So you can easily see that diversity itself brings excellence. So because our way of thinking is uh, uh, a mutual understanding of respect and how we would be working together. So thank you very much for inviting me, Professor Senaratna. I hope this will be a useful presentation for people to think and ponder. And if you want to contact me, that's my email address. I'll be happy to be in contact with you. As I mentioned, my two major crops that I work on are canola and wheat, but I also work on other crops, including barley. So I'll stop there and entertain any questions you may have. Thank you very much, sir, for your interesting presentation. I hope uh, uh, audience can pose questions. Professor Delanter will be answering to those questions. Uh, we, we are a bit lagging behind the time. Uh, quickly, we move on to the next item. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Pro, uh, Professor Aruna Virasurya. He is from University Prairie View a and University, USA. Over to you, Professor Aruna. Thank you, uh, Shanta, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Senatna, uh, for uh, having me in this forum to talk uh, to you all. And uh, I'm also, uh, like Dilant, uh, a proud uh, product of Perandini Science Faculty, uh, thanks to my uh, teachers and the mentors. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, we all heard uh, how we need to move uh, and change our uh, research culture in Sri Lanka in the previous uh, uh, talks. Uh, now, I am going to uh, talk about what I can offer, what I'm doing here, and why, what I can offer to the, the Sri Lankan student and scientist while I am here. I was, uh, before joining to Texas, I was uh, in University of Mississippi uh, for 10 years where I developed a, a, a plant science, especially on medicinal plant program. And then uh, they invited me to join here in Texas to develop the, uh, the similar uh, program. I moved uh, to Texas in uh, 2000, uh, early 2013. Uh, so a good thing in Texas is Texas, uh, uh, is uh, five times bigger than Sri Lanka, and we have uh, 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 subtropical climate, so I feel more like uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, we can uh, use a lot of, uh, you know, the plants uh, uh, to grow here, like in Sri Lanka, so I enjoy what I'm doing, and uh, so I will move uh, into uh, the, the presentation, and I'm going to discuss, this is my short outline, I'm not going to talk too much, uh, my research capacity in uh, the Prairie View, and uh, Prairie View is one of the uh, member universities in the, the, the Texas a and system where we have uh, 14 universities. Uh, we work together uh, in research and uh, academics. Uh, so I teach in various universities uh, while doing uh, collaborative uh, research with uh, uh, different, different uh, universities. Uh, so I talk about uh, my uh, the, the capacity in my uh, the College uh, of Agriculture and the research highlights uh, I have currently, and then the, the availability of uh, opportunities in my uh, department. Right, uh, when we look at uh, the capacity uh, um, in the plant and environmental sciences here, uh, we have 780 uh, research uh, farm, 
the acres of 780 uh, research farms so that allow us to do a uh, lot of various uh, uh, agro agriculture research and basic science research uh, in the field and we have a huge collection of uh, greenhouses they are climate controlled and grow chambers and the new addition is the pheno ai expert system where you can do the phenotyping and use artificial intelligence for uh, plant uh, phenotyping to understand their growth uh, throughout the growth cycles and uh, to characterize them and then uh, i have a colab uh, complex which includes uh, genomics uh, analytical and microbiological uh, facilities and apart from that uh, we are maintaining a huge germplasm collection of uh, medicinal plants from all over the world uh, and also we have underutilized uh, crop species uh, collection uh, which we are trying to further develop uh, the, the various uh, crops and recently we added the cannabis also into the, uh, the our research uh, uh, line right uh, so the, the 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 plant and environmental science uh, department has these uh, the, the key research areas and uh, i am actually uh, the trained in plant systematics uh, and i did uh, uh, i started uh, my career uh, with professor dasnaik and dr cyril richesundara in royal botanic garden speradenia uh, writing the flora of ceylon and then i moved into my uh, doctorate on uh, anonesia systematics but when you look at uh, the PO systematics, uh, there is no much use uh, in it. So I had to expand my horizons. Uh, so I switched on to medicinal plants and characterizing and uh, the, the, the applied part of the uh, science uh, in it. So uh, I uh, mainly focus on systematics. I still work on systematics on various uh, parts of the, the world uh, uh, in floristic revisions. And uh, the, the mainly focus on uh, the research is mainly focused here in the, the university is uh, uh, towards the medicinal plants and underutilize uh, the, the crops uh, uh, because in the US, as you know, the, the, the healthcare cost is very high and uh, uh, the, the people think uh, the natural way of, uh, you know, uh, maintaining health by using plant-based uh, healthy product is uh, better for your health. But it is not true all the time uh, because uh, these more, most of these plants are growing in the one part of the world, but the products they develop here in the US. So the raw material comes from somewhere else. And we have no idea about the safety, quality, uh, and efficacy of uh, these uh, products. So by having uh, the, the living medicinal plant collection, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, the characterize the medicinal plants using genomic, chemical, and botanical data, and then uh, uh, compare the, the quality and safety of the products using those markers. So my one of my research labs are mainly focusing on with uh, working with the US FDA uh, to uh, evaluate the uh, the quality uh, of the uh, the, the plant-based uh, health uh, the product. And then we have a plant biochemistry, molecular biology group, polymer chemistry, phytochemistry, plant breeding, and we have specialty crop and urban agriculture, uh, plant physiology, uh, mainly on the crop branching patterns on uh, the, the, the major crops and biotechnology and agronomy, uh, bioinformatics, and then the environmental uh, team has water and natural resource management. And they also focus on global climatic change uh, remote uh, and remote uh, sensing. So let's look at some of uh, uh, the, the, the key work we are doing here. Now, uh, the living uh, germplasm collection and seed bank has over uh, 2,000 accessions at the moment, and we are still exploring uh, the, the, the plants uh, through the collaborations with other countries. 
and uh, <clears throat> uh, currently we are focusing on two plant species and this actually has already completed the, the, the working on this plant, uh, the phyllodiasis. We are looking at the natural sweetness because obesity is one of the uh, big uh, problem in the US and uh, the consumption of uh, high calorie food and the sugar is a major uh, the problem. So USDA funded us to find out the natural sweetness and uh, try to introduce them to the uh, industry uh, uh, in the, uh, the the food industry. So when I was doing field work uh, in Peru, I found this plant and uh, uh, it, it has a natural sweetener. This is known compound Hernandalcine. And uh, but the problem in this plant was uh, the plant itself producing. Uh, the aromatic compound called camphor, you all know, kapuru like, right? So it is kind of bitter and masking the sweetener, uh, the, the sweetness uh, taste. So what we did was, uh, this is the, before the CRISPR coming into the, uh, the stage. Uh, so what we did was we looked at the biosynthetic pathways of the Hernandalcine production and the camphor production and then by fine tuning the the micronutrients of this uh, the the plant we provide we manage to switch off the genes uh, of cancer production uh, and then we manage to uh, uh, get uh, the the higher uh, hernandals in production in this plant and we got patent a couple of, couple of months ago for this uh, method uh, now uh, this plant, the Hernandalcine, is uh, a thousand about thousand times sweeter than uh, sugar, and now we are working with uh, uh, the industry like uh, Coca-Cola uh, to uh, include the, the Hernandalcine uh, into their product, and also we have introduced this plant as cash crop, naval cash crop, uh, for the Texas uh, uh, farmers. And the other one, we are currently working on this. This is the, uh, called monkey fruit. Uh, and coming from China, it can be grown here in Texas. And we grow the, the, this uh, picture is from our collection. And uh, this has another sweeter, sweetener called uh, mongrosite. And, uh, but uh, it has uh, some uh, interfering compounds. And we are working uh, towards uh, suppressing those other unwanted uh, compound to make it more uh, productive uh, in uh, the, the, the natural sweetener uh, to introduce into the mainstream in the the, the industry. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, sorry, uh, underutilized uh, med edible medicinal species. Now, these are not new to uh, the, the, the Sri Lanka. You see the Mama Dika Cochin Chinese is, uh, Karavila, uh, Tuba Karavila, Labu, and uh, Dandila yam, they have never been grown in uh, Texas. But as you know, the Houston area uh, is multicultural, right? Uh, and people are looking for this kind of, they are missing this, uh, the, the vegetables. So what we did was uh, we started growing them and introducing uh, to the full culture. And as you know, these are also having a lot of medicinal uh, properties. And we are working with the Texas uh, uh, Medical Institutes uh, to find out uh, the, 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 get the clinical studies done on the effect of uh, these, uh, the crops. And some of these crops are now in the hands of uh, the specialty fruit growers in Texas, and especially Mavadika Davisia, which we had the, 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 the spine board or the Tumbakara uh, we ha only had in Indian shops uh, as uh, the frozen, uh, uh, the veggie section. Now you can get the fresh uh, Momodika Daesia. And we have extension program to introduce uh, these novel uh, edible fruits to the American food culture and Americans started eating them. So now you see we are getting ready for the uh, the, the 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 food shortage uh, the challenge in the future adding more 
novel crops and novel food, uh, plant-based food uh, into uh, this system. So this uh, research also heavily funded by uh, US uh, DA, right? That is one. And the new one is the cannabis. Uh, as you know, uh, now the Texas got uh, the, the, the license uh, to grow uh, non-narcotic uh, cannabis that is called industrial hemp. So this doesn't give you any uh, high and the THC level is below 0.3% uh, uh, um, uh, right? So but the problem is now as you know since uh, the cannabis was banned in the world uh, the cannabis was landed in the hand of illegal growers. So the plant has been bred more and more uh, to get the narcotic effect than the other good uh, uh, the the, uh, the factors uh, in the uh, the plant. So when you look at the genetic, even in the industrial hair, hair uh, the it is very very reticulate and very complex. So uh, we started developing a germplasm collection uh, of uh, all the cannabis. Uh, uh, strains, uh, non-narcotic strains available in uh, whole US and we are now the leading uh, cannabis uh, germplasm collection and the leading uh, cannabis uh, research group in the, uh, the Texas and as you know Texas has a lot of agricultural land and we got a lot of uh, 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 interest from the farmers, industry uh, to work with us and I will show you some of uh, the exciting work we are uh, doing with the uh, industry on this plan. Now, I know uh, Sri Lanka has a lot of debate on uh, cannabis legalization and uh, all these debates are uh, because they don't understand really uh, what we can get from cannabis and they always fear about uh, the, the na narcotic type. Now, we are not growing anything narcotic here. We all look at the non-narcotic species and how we can uh, use uh, it uh, in uh, the industry uh, and the agriculture, right? So we are uh, characterizing our uh, uh, whole cannabis uh, collection here using phenomic, genomic, and finger, uh, chemical fingerprinting. And then we will identify uh, the, the, the best performing strains. And then we will uh, do field trials uh, for those strains and then recommend for the uh, Texas Department of Agriculture uh, uh, to the best uh, strain so that they can uh, guide the farmers uh, uh, how to grow uh, the best strains uh, for the, uh, the Texas. And also, the mainly uh, the non-narcotic uh, industrial hemp is mainly used uh, for either fiber or the phytochemicals, mainly the cannabinoids or the seed grains, right? The fiber is used in various applications from uh, water repellent uh, cloth uh, to the house. Uh, what is called is hempcrete. It has a vast fiber that can convert uh, into the hempcrete and the, now the houses are built using the hemp-based uh, uh, concrete. Uh, and the cannabinoids are mainly the, uh, the CBD, uh, the the phytocannabinoid uh, th that has a lot of medicinal properties because it mimics our uh, endocannabinoids in the human body. Endocannabinoids are the uh, the the messengers uh, help you to keep uh, the body uh, homeostasis. And uh, uh, when you lose the homeostasis, you, you know uh, you will get a lot of various diseases, and with the age. Uh, you, you, you will uh, get the lower endocannabinoid production. And when you have external phytocannabinoids like this, you can maintain uh, better health. Now, the FDA is uh, doing uh, research with us to add uh, in, in the, the, these uh, phytocannabinoids into the various food products because it improves the uh, the, the body uh, function. It, it is going to be added into the milk, like vitamin D, and added into the cereals, and uh, so on. 
Uh, and the seed grain has a lot of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid and a lot of protein. And as you know now, uh, the food culture is changing a lot. Uh, people are uh, uh, rejecting uh, animal-based uh, milk because some of the sugars in the milk uh, is supporting the cancer uh, growth, uh, certain cancer growth. And now they are moving into the plant-based uh, uh, milk. Uh, so. Uh, now, uh, you see here in the uh, grocery stores, a lot of various plant-based uh, uh, milk products and the hemp milk is uh, one of the uh, new additions. So, we are working with, uh, with the interdisciplinary team, food scientists, chemists, regulators to make this industry uh, sustainable in the, uh, the Texas. And when you look at uh, the the... The, 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 the plant growth, uh, cannabinoids uh, produced only in the uh, female uh, plant uh, trichomes, uh, and uh, uh, those are, uh, so the, uh, the, if the crop is growing for the, uh, purely for the cannabinoid production, so you need to get in only to the female plants uh, grown in the the, uh, the field. If you get a single male plant, that can ruin the cannabinoid production because cannabinoid is made uh, in the, this plant uh, to attract the uh, the the improve the, uh, the the pollination. So if you have male plant and the uh, the pollen is landed in the female plant, it reduces the uh, cannabinoid production in the plant. Uh, so uh, we are working on uh, the, the looking at the molecular mechanism of sex expression, and we recently uh, uh, used the the CRISPR method uh, to knock off some of the the, the flowering genes, and we are in, uh, halfway uh, in the process uh, of that. And um, when it comes to the male plants, uh, now male plants give the best fiber. As you know, uh, the cannabis is uh, 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 the wind pollinating uh, plant species, so the plants need to grow taller uh, to uh, release their uh, pollen into the air. So in the field, uh, you can see the male plants are emerging uh, more than uh, the, the female uh, plants. So, but after uh, they uh, finish the flowering, uh, all the, the energy pumping to the, uh, the, the fiber production uh, stopped. So the fiber quality goes down. So we thought um, if we, if we uh, stop the male plant flowering, we can increase the 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 biomass and the the fiber production. So we did the the bioengineering. We used CRISPR and uh, knocked off the uh, flowering gene in male plants. And you see uh, this picture I took yesterday. Actually, this is two week old plant. Now these are th these plants are about two three uh, months old plants. And you see the height, uh, it is uh, reaching the greenhouse, uh, uh, the roof. It is about 10 foot uh, and not flowering. So we are still uh, waiting if it is, uh, you know, we, we still don't know. We have not the right gene, uh, uh, but it is uh, uh, growing very fast and giving very good uh, bio biomass, right? And we have developed under this, uh, this became very, um, um, uh, hot topic in the Texas uh, uh, soon after uh, uh, they legalized it uh, here last year. So a lot of private companies jumped uh, uh, and uh, donate money uh, for our research uh, to uh, address some of their questions. Uh, so uh, we got a very, very strong uh, private partnerships. And also when, when we look at uh, certain uh, the the strains we have, we found some interesting facts. I just want to show here. Now, usually the cannabinoid uh, uh, is produced in the flower buds and some plants started expressing into the younger leaves also, which has not 
uh, reported uh, uh, before. Now we are looking at the molecular mechanism of this one also, then uh, we can get clear understanding uh, why it is happening in uh, various uh, the, the strains. Right, uh, so let's move into the... Uh, now, uh, this is how uh, we have, these are the few uh, strong companies uh, uh, we develop private partnerships, Aden Green, and uh, they are one of the leading uh, uh, indoor production uh, uh, company. Uh, we have another project going on uh, with them, and I will show you what we are doing uh, in that part. And uh, Pharmacopoeia, uh, this uh, group donated uh, 18 million for us uh, for research and uh, student training uh, on uh, <clears throat> on the industrial. Uh, him and we have another company uh, dedicated uh, to uh, uh, collection of data and uh, making the data driven uh, decision making for all farmers, breeders, researchers, and also the uh, the, the the government agencies who control uh, this uh, crop. And we have Canna Farms uh, uh, working with uh, uh, the the product development for animal. Uh, uh, production, uh, the cows, uh, chicken, and you know the hemp, when you extract uh, uh, the, the, the hemp uh, CBD, there is a big uh, group of uh, uh, flavonoids and terpenes there, uh, which we can use in various uh, other product development. As you know, the terpenes uh, are the uh, the, the compounds uh, used in plant signaling, and we use uh, some of these terpenes to improve uh, uh, the growth uh, properties uh, of certain crop uh, species in greenhouse settings. And also we use the uh, flavonoids in uh, poultry, uh, uh, the cows, uh, meals, uh, to improve their meat quality and the egg quality and their reproductive uh, 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 the quality and so on, because uh, uh, all metasoans has this uh, endocannabinoid system. So uh, it works uh, as it works in the, uh, the human. So we found it improves the animal health uh, too. We have a huge uh, veterinary team also uh, working on uh, that uh, as aspect. And recently we started the MOU with the BioCity Hemp Company, the largest Hemp extracting company uh, in the the the, the Houston, uh, Texas. They they receive all the biomass from the farmers uh, uh, of hemp growing in uh, uh, Texas, and then they 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 extract uh, CBD and they will uh, sell the pure CBD for the uh, the clinicals. Uh, and various other uh, the products, and they offered us. Uh, the byproducts for further uh, product development research. So what I found was uh, there are a lot of wax uh, they, uh, they, they, they remove in the process and I brought them to the lab and uh, look at the composition and I found that there are a lot of uh, antibacterial, antiviral, uh, antifungal compounds in it. So uh, we started uh, using that wax as uh, the protective coating for perishable fruits and uh, vegetables. Now, currently, you know here, the apples, pears, bell pepper, um, you know, like all these uh, perishable fruits and vegetables are uh, coated with uh, paraffin wax, right? It is petroleum wax. So uh, we got uh, recently uh, developed uh, uh, the hemp-based edible wax, uh, for uh, this kind of uh, application, and we are working with them uh, to uh, introduce that to the uh, the market. And uh, th there is a big uh, uh, association uh, making the connections of uh, the hemp farmers, researchers, and the industry. So we are working with them. Um, 
uh, very very effectively we conduct uh, workshops uh, seminars webinars and uh, all sort of uh, uh, the technology transfer uh, platforms uh, to the audiences uh, around us and these are some of the the products available in uh, the market uh, now now you know uh, we can grow uh, even in texas we can grow him in the summer uh, season it will die in the uh, winter season this is where the sri lanka can move uh, for the industrial hemp but just remove uh, the the narcotic part and you need to characterize or whatever available the germplasm in uh, uh, the, the sri lanka and focus on the non narcotic uh, uh, ones uh, to develop new uh, crops uh, one of the medical scientists working with me in the texas medical center has uh, recently developed the heart stent and the fallopian stent using the hemp fibers and also she uses uh, the these fibers as a scaffolding for the burn injuries to grow the cells over it because uh, these fibers won't give any uh, rejection or adverse effect it is bio uh, polymer material right so there are a lot of industries lot of opportunities to explore uh, and uh, we are still uh, working on uh, this part of uh, the crop right and apart from that you will see some of the green vegetables and uh, we uh, in uh, american food culture and, uh, not like ours they only eat selected greens so that means uh, we uh, they are not getting enough uh, interesting secondary metabolites plant based secondary metabolites through uh, their uh, food so there is a big uh, demand for uh, now for the medicinally important greens so we started introducing like you know uh, the niviti and uh, from egypt uh, this is egyptian spinach this is a malabar spinach we call niviti and uh, i think we have this species uh, in sri lanka as wild and uh, no one is eating but uh, the, this is very uh, popular vegetable in the arabic culture uh, that is called egyptian spinach um, and we have new, new zealand spinach and the parsley you know the uh, the potulaka we have as a weed uh, in sri lanka but we rarely eat right but they have a lot of good uh, phytochemicals uh, uh, help to maintain our uh, health so we introduce all these things and we recently introduced moringa also here yeah? moringa grows very well in texas now i have two trees in my backyard also mm-hmm. uh, and these are novel uh, species we introduced uh, to uh, texas farmers and these are very highly prized uh, and uh, the market and mo- most of the 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 grocery stores uh, carry uh, these uh, specialty crop section uh, demonstrating how to cook and what are the uh, health benefits so it it uh, receives a lot of attention uh, in the local uh, communities right so this is how i mean this is nothing new uh, to the sri lankans but this make a big impact uh, in our research here and usda continuously funding this research and now this is my seventh year for this uh, type of uh, research and very recently we started working with the nasa uh, because now uh, they are moving towards uh, space uh, um, agriculture and space travels you need to have uh, uh, low volume high nutritious uh, plant species uh, to eat uh, when you are in space travel and space uh, uh, you know in settlements so we started growing microgreens uh, and try to improve their um, uh, the the secondary metabolite production by Uh, manipulating various uh, light uh, regimes so we found uh, the the novel uh, blue and red uh, led lights can hugely change 
the the nutrient value in these various uh, microgreens as you know the secondary metabolites means the taste uh, aroma and the color and those are produced in the plants uh, as a response uh, to various uh, stress or sometimes to attract uh, other organisms or deter the, 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 the other organisms. Uh, but they are very helpful for our uh, health because that is how we have evolved. Uh, the humans uh, evolved with uh, the plants and how we ended up eating plants and how we selected various plant species into our uh, food culture. So, uh, this has become a hot topic and very recently got uh, a good amount of money uh, from NASA to uh, study uh, the microgreens. Uh, and uh, now the microgreens are sold uh, uh, in the high-end uh, restaurants and they are very uh, pricey. Uh, microgreens is not the sprout. They are little older than the, the sprout. Uh, so you let... Uh, the two true leaves uh, emerge from the seedling and then you harvest them and uh, pack them. The good thing in microgreen is you can grow them uh, uh, in the, the, the selling clamshell itself. So the live plant can uh, sold in the market and you can take it as a live plant and when you're ready to eat, you can harvest in your kitchen and use it. So they are very highly, highly nutrition. And when you look at the mature plant uh, and the, the microgreen, the, uh, the microgreen has secondary metabolized uh, 40 times higher than in the mature plant. Now you can see how value uh, is the, uh, the, this kind of functional uh, fruit food. And also uh, we have a separate uh, section. We are, uh, sweet potato is not a, uh, 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 kind of traditional crop in Texas, uh, but uh, one of uh, my colleague uh, work on uh, sweet potato breeding, and he managed to develop uh, uh, purple and golden uh, sweet potato suitable for Texas climate uh, and the, uh, the the paste and uh, purple and gold we selected because that is our prior view university uh, colors. It's a kind of marketing. And also we introduce edible uh, leaf leafy variety of sweet potato. Uh, this is also getting a lot of uh, attention. And we also work on various uh, bio uh, polymers to use in agriculture. As you know, uh, the chitosan, chitin um, is in uh, available in uh, the shellfish uh, waste, and we extracted uh, chitosan, chitin uh, uh, from the the waste, and then used it in agriculture to improve uh, the yield uh, and the shelf life of uh, perishable uh, selected uh, the crops. So one group is uh, working on that part of uh, 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 research. And uh, we have physiologists working on uh, the, the, the monocot uh, uh, crop species and they are branching how it helps to increase the, uh, the yield. Uh, so he look at uh, the molecular uh, mechanisms of branching and then uh, manipulate the genes to uh, improve uh, the, the, the yield in various uh, crops, right? And the, 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 the novel thing we started uh, recently was uh, developing uh, urban agriculture production, uh, indoor agriculture production. This is what we developed with uh, the company called Aden Green. Uh, and they developed uh, uh, one acre vertical grow, uh, growth facility uh, in the university uh, so that our student can be trained. We do the research and th this, uh, the, the produce goes to the local uh, market. This is actually the uh, leafy uh, vegetable, mostly salad greens and the, the common herbs. Uh, we used to uh, uh, grow in this uh, part of the world. And uh, so what, what we did was uh, we improve uh, the, the taste 
uh, and the spiciness, uh, aroma, crunchiness in these uh, uh, greens uh, by uh, mimicking these plants using the byproducts of the hemp, uh, the terpenes. We use uh, releasing, now the, the, this greenhouse is fully computerized. Uh, every, this panel uh, has uh, sensors and it detects uh, what is the, uh, the right amount of fertilizer needs. This is a, a combined aeroponics and hydroponics going together. No uh, chemicals used, only the, uh, the, uh, the aeroponics uh, nutrient mixture. And we have uh, small uh, individual carbon dioxide releasing uh, mechanism to each plant in this system. And with that carbon dioxide, we managed to uh, include the little bit of uh, mycene, uh, the terpene we extracted from the, uh, the, the, the hemp uh, in this greenhouse that improved the color development and also the crispiness and the, uh, the, the spiciness uh, in the, uh, the plant. So it is very new and uh, we are doing a lot of manipulations and we are introducing uh, various other uh, the, the, the terpenes also because when we damage these plants, we notice that uh, the mycene is the, the major terpene released from uh, the, these leafy greens. So uh, that is the signaling when you damage the, the plant, the plant release these stress uh, chemicals to let other plants to get ready for this uh, the danger. So we thought this is the mechanism going in the, the plant and we artificially released the mycene uh, into the system that improved uh, the uh, the spiciness and the the quality uh, of the uh, the green and we had taste panels and we had the chemi uh, chemical uh, uh, fingerprinting uh, to uh, prove uh, what is happening uh, inside so uh, this is uh, these are something i actually i was trying to introduce to sri lanka because we are talking a lot of uh, of using uh, the the agrochemicals and now going trying to go into the agriculture which is which i don't think is not uh, uh, we can do overnight and um, and getting chinese uh, organic fertilizer is very uh, scary uh, i will tell you one of the very very small um, yeah, the example i looked at uh, the chinese uh, can vegetable products come into the US market and I analyzed them and I found a lot of pharmaceutical residues in the product. So I immediately informed to the uh, FDA and found uh, they, they stopped uh, selling all these products. Uh, then we found uh, they are using the human waste uh, for their agricultural product. So I'm really feared whether the Sri Lanka will be ended uh, using uh, the you know uh, low quality um, uh, the, the organic fertilizer coming from somewhere else who is trying to dump their uh, the waste so we need to be very as scientists we need to be proactive uh, and uh, save the, the the country's agriculture uh, systematically we can we can go go into the, uh, the, the 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 organic system but we can't change it overnight or within a few years it takes a lot of time and the the, the country like sri lanka uh, does not have um, enough space we are an island and population is increase increasing and we we will not have enough uh, agricultural lands in the future so the best thing is to go for high throughput agriculture like this have one setting one greenhouse setting with the science and artificial intelligence robotics used in the system and make the own product fresh products uh, to the the, the consumers we, that will help the quality product, uh, good, uh, I mean, export market and uh, reducing the post harvest uh, losses. Uh, and uh, we are not going to use uh, chemicals there, right? right? This chemical free. 
no pesticide, no fungicide. And uh, we sell this. And this one acre uh, greenhouse, uh, we grow five to ten uh, growing cycles per year because we can manipulate the light uh, and the environment. And this, from this one acre, we produce 286 acre worth of uh, produce uh, yearly. Now you can imagine uh, how much uh, uh, we can generate. This Eden Green is the major uh, producer in the US uh, now, and it has started uh, uh, expanding uh, to Australia. And also very recently, we are uh, working with the Singapore government uh, to establish something like this in uh, Singapore. So these are the, something we can uh, give to the country. And I, I, I was in touch with uh, various entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka uh, to introduce uh, this uh, so that we can uh, work and we can grow our own greens uh, uh, in this kind of uh, system, right? So I have another meeting in three minutes, so I have to leave. Um, so these are the opportunities uh, I can provide I have graduate program and uh, feel free to contact me. And if I don't have uh, the program fitting into your interest, then I can get you connected uh, into uh, the appropriate, uh, uh, the universities and the professors. And I'm mostly looking forward to have a uh, study abroad, a student exchange program and uh, postdoctoral training available. Uh, currently, I have uh, several Sri Lankans working uh, in my lab, and uh, I am mentoring a couple of students in the uh, University of Colombo, uh, and uh, also can provide uh, short-term visits uh, for uh, students and scientists, um, and open to mentoring uh, Sri Lankan students, and also happy to collaborate uh, with uh, the research grants and publications. And now you got an idea what kind of science we are doing. I am a systematist, but uh, how I use plant systematics in the applied uh, science. So this is where we need to move. So uh, because we, we are facing uh, food shortage in the future. And so we need to feed the, uh, the, the people globally and the climatic chains are really challenging. So there are a lot we can uh, do uh, together. So feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions. And uh, this is my cell phone number. Feel free to contact uh, me uh, for any uh, help uh, I can give from uh, this end. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry I have to leave because I, 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 I didn't expect uh, this will go, go this long. And I have another uh, private company uh, coming to uh, meet us uh, for a collaborative research. So I have to leave. Uh, thanks very much uh, for uh, having me in this forum. Thanks again for the NSF and the organizing team uh, to have me, uh, give me the opportunity to share all this uh, uh, information with you guys. And I'm looking forward to have very, very fruitful collaboration. I got my free education. Let me help you guys uh, uh, and help me, the country, uh, back. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Arunavir Surya. Uh, we well taken your message. I think your, uh, uh, your speech addressed academia research as well as industry. And of course, uh, uh, you can leave. There were some questions in the ch uh, chat box. But uh, definitely, we will channel those to after the event to you, and we will make a facilitation. Any interesting parties, we will link with you, and uh, for a long-term partnerships. Looking for thank you very much for uh, joining uh, in spite of your busy time schedule. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I'm looking forward uh, for the communication. Sure. Okay. sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, now we a bit behind the time schedule, I think. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we will uh, we can take a very general uh, couple of questions. Therefore, I open the floor for question and answer session. 
The session will be moderated by uh, Professor Ranjit Sena Ratna, chairman of the National Science Foundation, and Professor Nadira Karunavira, uh, uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. Over to you, sir, madam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, uh, uh, actually, the speakers mainly are uh, <laughs> male, so I would like the moderation to be uh, mainly done by Professor Nadira. I'll be in the background. If necessary, I would come in. Otherwise, I would appreciate you, Professor Nadira. You do uh, the uh, Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Sena Ratna. Uh, I would like to join the NSF in thanking all four speakers uh, for sharing your very impressive work, uh, as well as the inspirational stories that you shared. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, young scientists who have joined this webinar and the messages you conveyed, I am not sure whether you realize the impact that uh, those messages would have had on their young minds. I'm sure it would help to mold, mold their careers, hopefully uh, having a positive impact on countries' uh, future as well. Uh, there, there were a few questions, um, maybe uh, before I uh, come to that, I would like to just mention about these uh, new initiatives uh, that, that are being done through the NSA, which will be of interest to you. Uh, the, the interest, as, as you know, the uh, focus has been on earlier, the publications, university ranking, and so on. However, uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that the scientific output in Sri Lanka ha hasn't had that much of uh, an impact on countries' development. So we are having a lot of discussions at uh, the NSF how best we could uh, redirect uh, these uh, initiatives uh, research uh, to have a, a more positive impact on countries' development, identifying the gaps uh, and how science could help in bridging those gaps and so on. So I'm sure uh, we'll get opportunities to reach out to you all as a uh, Sri Lankan, uh, originally from Sri Lanka. I'm sure you will be happy to contribute. Uh, and I appreciate very much your level of enthusiasm in uh, making such contributions. There was an interesting question uh, posed by Professor Saro Singh. I wonder whether you saw it in the chat box. Uh, uh, his uh, question was basically to ask your views on uh, the retirement age of academics uh, in Sri Lanka, which is fixed at 65 years. What are your thoughts on that? How it has an impact on scientific advancement? Maybe uh, <clears throat> while others are thinking, thank you very much, uh, Professor Saroj, for that question. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Nadira, for uh, repeating that question. I think it's a very valid question. Um, uh, I think it uh, has uh, implications both ways, right? For example, uh, if you think of uh, uh, in retirement age, retirement ages are put for a certain reason so that uh, there's opportunity for the younger people to come um, take on these positions. But at the same time, uh, Dr. Saroj, uh, Professor Saroj is ex correct. That's the ripe age that you are really doing well, if you're really doing well, not particularly uh, the, the A. So maybe I'll answer the question in a different way. <clears throat> Let's say, there is a certain thing that is being done so well by a person. Let's say Dr. Jasinger in, uh, in, uh, in the pandemic, uh, of the first phase of the pandemic. Yes, it is the right age that he had to retire. But is that the right time for him to retire? That's the question that I would always ask uh, people, because if somebody is doing fantastic work, it doesn't matter about the age. That's the time that Sri Lanka needs that person. 
So you can give a much bigger position to that person, but that's not going to make any difference because that person was passionate about what he was doing and that is the right place for him to do that work. So Professor Jaya Singh's question, Saroj's question, I think is very important for um, not particularly for just to keep people after 65, but um, uh, the governments uh, or the universities being in a position or the UGC being in a position to reappoint uh, as a fellow. I think um, that was some of the ideas that uh, Professor Saroj has. A fellow or another uh, position, not just emeritus. Emeritus doesn't particularly do anything. It's just a title. I think there has to be more for that person to really contribute. And that contribution comes by recognition. And the recognition should become not because of the age, even beyond the age, you have to recognize people that are doing excellent work for the country, not even for yourself, for the, for the university, but for the country. Country has to come first. That idea has to come into our minds in Sri Lanka, that the country comes first, then everything will flow well. And I think uh, Professor uh, Saroj's question is extremely valid. And I think uh, that's how I would see it. Thank, thank you, Professor Fernando. Uh, any other uh, thoughts that uh, you would want to share? Other two speakers? Yeah, uh, I agree with Please, the yeah. uh, I agree with the uh, We don't have a retirement age in the UK. I have some colleagues of 70, 75 years. Um, I have some uh, uh, adjacent professors from various other countries who are very old. Mm, I think uh, I agree with Delante. If there is a kind of idea to reappoint them as a fellow or whatever, uh, in order to uh, get that person's you know, service, for the benefit of young people. I agree. Uh, thank you. Thank you. For uh, uh, my, my PhD supervisor, I, I finished my PhD about, uh, I think, 28 years ago. Um, my PhD supervisor is still working. And thank you for sharing those thoughts. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we should move on. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, I would like to ask uh, the three of you uh, whether you have uh, like one last message you would like to convey, particularly to the young scientists in Sri Lanka. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Saman Halgamke. Yeah. Um... I think uh, it's okay to be ambitious. That's what I think I have to convey. And if you're young and um, and you're ambitious and set a goal and try to achieve it, and you might not achieve it, but still you get closer. So that is important. That's the message here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Fernando? Uh, you have to un unmute yourself, please. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so here's my message. So I uh, already got a few uh, emails from students who are participating in this uh, webinar. And thank you to them for their um, uh, participating as well as uh, having a keen interest in uh, graduate studies, higher education. So uh, I will take the time and uh, reply to each one of them. Uh, one uh, comment that I wanted to uh, take uh, from uh, actually listening to Professor Sam Saman, I think you should not be uh, thinking of uh, um, somebody not replying to you as a no. It is, I think he laid out very well some of the reasons, and sometimes we are just plain uh, busy. Like Saman, I take uh, more uh, time in uh, uh, answering, reading, and answering Sri Lankan students uh, see, uh, when they uh, send emails. 
But at the same time, I think that courtesy has to be from the Sri Lankan students as well. I have experienced uh, some Sri Lankan students, if I replied saying that at the moment there's no position, but I explained fairly well, I will never get even a thank you. So that little courtesy uh, 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 has to come from, so after a few uh, situations like that, we get discouraged. Why am I taking my time to answer the questions? Are they putting a fishing net to look at opportunities, just uh, uh, sending uh, emails. And I think one of the drawbacks and the dangers today is that opportunity to blind copy and send to 1,000 uh, professors at the same time. And sometimes I get emails saying, um, you are at the University of Calgary. So I can easily see that it was a cut and paste. So these things have to be changed. Uh, I think one important way to look at it is from uh, visiting each professor's website. We have websites. It clearly explains what we do. And again, going back to someone, uh, he said, passion, fall in love with what you want to do. And if that's the area that you really want to uh, focus and get that technology into your uh, profile, go for it. And that's where you will put all your energy and uh, uh, try your best to get a position. So um, to the young scientists, I, I admire you, uh, your, your degrees, what you have done. Now you are at the stepping stone for a great future. That's how uh, I saw it. And thank you to the mentors who I had, who wrote those letters of recommendation. At the time that I went for my PhD, there were no emails. It was one application and that was my whole salary for the application. Uh, 50 US dollars was the application at that time. And I think it's still the same. So, so when I did that, I couldn't apply uh, for a thousand. I had to apply for one and hope for the best and it worked. So, uh, so naturally things have changed. There's a lot of opportunity for the graduate students today, just with a small email, you can get an answer very quickly, but don't misuse it, use it correctly and get that passion as someone said, get the passion. And one final thought, unfortunately there are many people who are calling themselves professors now. Uh, I see that in the media uh, in Sri Lanka and the media personnel don't check to see whether that person is a real, real professor. To become a professor, it takes time. Uh, I started as an assistant professor, then I rose to associate professor, and then to a full professor, and then out to a dean. So all that takes time, all that um, has implications, research success. When people are just misusing the word professor, it is demeaning and it is sending the wrong message to the young people because they, those people who are calling themselves professors are not behaving as good scientists or good professors. They are just talking to the media to get attention. They talk of things that they don't know, and it's unfortunate. So I think this, this that culture has to change. So I hope I haven't opened a can of worms. I hope that's a clear message to the young people. Go, if somebody is calling themselves a professor, please go and check the websites to see whether that particular university has that person as a professor. I can name an individual that has been uh, very vocal recently. Unfortunately, she's not a professor. She's not anywhere. Uh, so, so those kind of things, unfortunately, have a bad uh, uh, black mark on the real professors who have work tirelessly and for the mentors who have trained them tirelessly to be who we are. So young people, you have to take things into your own hands. Social media is a blessing, but also uh, uh, sometimes like a devil. So use it correctly. Don't use social media just for criticizing. You have to have a plan if you are criticizing. You have to have a vision if you are criticizing. Mere criticism doesn't take us anywhere. So that's the final thought that I wanted to leave with the younger generation in Sri Lanka. If you do that correctly, Sri Lanka will be a much better place for the future. Thank you, Mr. Fernando.
And uh, I think uh, Professor Victor Nasinga can have the last word. But I can, uh, as a social scientist, I can speak to social scientists, young social scientists again. Um, one of the things I must stress here is that you need to look for the universities, I'm talking about British universities, websites uh, in the last quarter of the year for PhD scholarships. Um, normally in our university, we advertise for PhD scholarships in October, November time. Uh, for us to actually award scholarships for the following year, uh, beginning from September, October. So there is a process of developing a research proposal over a period of six months. Uh, if you have a first class, and if you have an excellent research proposal, and if you have excellent references, I'm sure you will definitely get a PhD scholarship here in the UK. I know that and I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident to say that because Sri Lankans are better, much, much better than other students from other countries. <clears throat> For example, uh, last time, last October, November time, I sent out an email to management faculty uh, or accounting department's head in Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, only one department responded to me. I asked the question, please recommend a good young person uh, for me to develop a research proposal with them uh, to organize a PhD scholarship here in my department. Uh, Javadunapura University uh, young lecturer won the scholarship this year and he, he was on the top of the list. We awarded 15 scholarships in the faculty and the Sri Lankan young academic became the top of the list. He worked towards a research proposal, an excellent research proposal uh, with me over a period of six months. And he got the scholarship because of the excellence in the research proposal. He has a first class, he is a chartered accountant, He's a senior lecturer in the department, et cetera, having five, six years of teaching experience. Uh, but the most important thing is his research proposal. Therefore, you can come to the UK. If you have a first class and if you have developed an excellent, I use the term, excellent research proposal, definitely, definitely you can win a PhD scholarship here. Thank Dr. You. Nadira, thank you. Um, um, can I just uh, add, add a few things? Uh, yes, to please. Yeah. 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 So uh, thank you, Dan, for bringing that up. I think that's a very Hello, important... Dan. That's can a very important... Can others please mute their <laughs> Can you mute yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, I think... Okay. Uh, but, uh, if the uh, model... Can you hear me, you go, no. If, uh, somebody can mute Lakshman, please. Lakshman, yes. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Dan brought a very important point that I missed uh, mentioning, and I think I should mention it for the research uh, on the biological sciences and agriculture, at least uh, uh, the way that I uh, uh, know uh, in Canada and the US. I did my PhD in the US, so I know exactly how that works as well. So um, uh, in, in Canada and the US, um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we don't particularly have scholarships for uh, graduate students who are coming from outside uh, at that time. So if they are overseas students, the best way to come and highly encouraged is to discuss the uh, 
thoughts you have in research with the uh, research supervisor, the professor. So for example, if somebody is coming to me, uh, share the CV. If you have a first class, of course, like what Dan said, that's where I get more uh, attention, but not necessarily. Sometimes when you read a, 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 a uh, CV and a letter of interest, you come to know that there's a better match with a lower, the second lower, because that research is really what uh, that person is wanting to do uh, that you are interested in as well. So in Canada and the US, research, uh, graduate students get research funding for research as well as the student stipend from the professor. So it's administered by the university, but all from the research grants that the professors have. So right now I have uh, four PhD students and uh, four master's students, all funded by uh, research projects that I have, all separate research projects. So uh, once they come here, uh, there are two things that they need to know. Uh, the tuition fees is three times more for a uh, um, foreign student. But as soon as they have a first class or second class, their tuition fees is reduced to the regular Canadian uh, number. So that's a scholarship by itself. So without paying the three times tuition, you pay the regular tuition fees that a Canadian graduate student will pay. The second point that I want to make is once you are here, you are eligible to start getting more scholarships and fellowships. Until you come here, you are not eligible for those. And also a difference in what Dan said is, the students generally don't write a proposal to get into a program because the proposal has already been written by the professors, got the funding for the student, and that's the time that the professor identifies or advertises. So a little bit different, but, uh, again, I cannot speak for the social sciences, Dan, but uh, in the sciences and agriculture, that f those fields, that's how it works here. And um, self-funded uh, people have asked me whether they can come with some self-funding, but the bench fees be paid by me. Uh, it is easy uh, to say yes, but it is also uh, something that the university generally says, be careful, be careful because after bringing somebody, if they cannot uh, meet uh, um, the living uh, conditions here with uh, the amount that they bring, that might be a trouble, a problem for the supervisor and to everybody. So they di generally discourage that. So in my case, I always find the funding and then uh, get the students. So that's why I have now we are able to have funding with uh, Ag Canada, Agriculture Canada. I have a Sri Lankan scientist that is collaborating with me. She and I will co-supervise the student that is going to come from University of Colombo in, uh, in uh, April of 2022. But the groundwork is already set. Everything so we have approved the faculty of graduate studies will approve and we'll go from there. So, um, so lots of opportunities once you come here, uh, scholarships, fellowships, and also I forgot to mention you can become a teaching assistant, and teaching assistant brings additional money, and that's uh, uh, very welcome because that uh, you will be uh, teaching in a lab, um, uh, doing the lab for the professor, and so on. So yeah, there are lots of opportunities once you're here. And thanks so much to all. Uh, yes, a question you. from uh, Mr. Dr. Dharmadasa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. please go ahead. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, with your permission, um, I'm not in the panel, uh, but uh, I just want to make a couple of uh, comments with my observations. My background is physics and electronic engineering. I have been over the last 40 years focusing on solar energy conversion and application in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Uh, I ran an eight year loan higher education link program with Sri Lankan universities, about five universities. Um, I noticed uh, two things. The first one is, as Delanta mentioned, communication. And I completed during that eight years, about 40 senior academic visits to my group. And when I arrange a visit to someone, communication is pretty fast. 
but when I organized a PhD studentship, when I was selecting a good student from Sri Lanka, people were not interested in communicating. I had to communicate three times to get a reply to, back to me. So my answer for my uh, observation for communication is, as we uh, noticed, all the expatriate successful people wants to give something back to the country. Naturally, they try to do things, but Sri Lankan graduate students and researchers should communicate, select those people and communicate and get the best out of them so that they can increase the publication. I am an editor, I am in uh, editorial board for three journals. Every year we look at the statistics. Sri Lanka is very, very low in physical sciences and engineering area. I think we need to improve in that area. Hopefully this uh, digital uh, platform will help to improve that. My second comment is about journals. Some years ago, uh, with a request, I published a very uh, good paper in Sri Lankan uh, journal, but the exposure to uh, international community is almost zero. Uh, what I see is in every university in Sri Lanka, they are trying to publish a, a journal from every university. That doesn't give the quality. What we need is uh, something like National Science Foundation taking the lead and publish few high quality journals so that impact factor goes high and the international visibility is going to be very high. I can see there are so many journals coming from every university that doesn't help us. So that is something, that's the second one. My final comment is about retirement. Uh, if an academic is very active in research and teaching and scholarly activities, when he comes, he yeah. or she comes to 65, that is the time the person has the knowledge, experience and the wisdom. And that is the time uh, that person can contribute a lot to that country. So that rule can be there, but the system should select the best person and keep that person working for the country. In United States, 80 years is not a problem for new employment. So those are the three comments I wanted to make here. I hope we can go forward with these new ideas and we can help uh, our country. Thank you. Excellent uh, uh, comments, Dr. Dharmadas. Uh, yeah, the third point in particular is so important. And uh, um, whether we agree or not, um, people like Dr. Fauci uh, in the US is 80 years and uh, exactly. he's, he's running the whole uh, COVID uh, uh, situation Absolutely. now with two presidents, not one president. So there might be controversy with his uh, position because of other things, but uh, age did not matter to be the head, right? So I think, uh, I think age, that limit has to be there for another reason, as we you just mentioned. Uh, otherwise, uh, people will fight to just keep the position yes. without being productive. Yes. But if you are a productive person, the university, the UGC or the government should recognize that and give that person an opportunity to continue in a Absolutely. different capacity even. Yeah. There was an article very recently, that article found where the uh, Nobel Prize winners end up. Most of the Nobel prizes, Prize winners end up in the United States yeah. because they give the opportunity, because, because they have the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience. They get the opportunity. That is why the country is doing well. Yeah. And yeah. on that point, if I if I'm allowed to say another thing that comes to my mind, uh, um, Doctor Professor uh, Dharmadas brought an excellent another excellent point. And again, this is to the uh, younger generation. I, I think we we have to recognize uh, that we cannot uh, have almost like inbreeding. Uh, if you have got a uh, degree from University of Peradeniya, you have to be um, interviewed at University of Ruhuna or Colombo to get a position 
in that field, not University of Peradeniya. The, the reason is, if you do that, you are more likely inbreeding the same thought process. And also that has an implication. If you are a junior scientist going back after a PhD to the same department that you got your studies from, you're always obliged to follow the rules and regulations that are set by your senior professors. That's to your detriment. So uh, not to say anything wrong about the senior professors, they are the mentors that uh, I really cherish, but you have to be open, independent and thinking. Now, yeah. think for a moment, if University of Melbourne, University of Manitoba uh, and um, uh, uh, Dance uh, University did not entertain Sri Lankans, we won't have these positions. Is it because Canadians, uh, Australians didn't have enough people to give these positions? No, they looked for the best. They looked for the best for that particular type of work and they hired that person. So if other countries can do that, so that's where Dr. Dharmadasa's point is well taken on Nobel Prize winners. Um, US is like a sponge. They take everyone who is uh, talented. And it is sometimes very appetizing, even as a Canadian now researcher, because I do get um, uh, uh, opportunities and invitations to join universities in the U.S. Uh, but for personal reasons, I have wanted I wanted to stay in the in Canada. But the point is, even in the music industry, even in the acting industry. There are many Canadians that young people will know, like Justin Bieber and many others. They're all Canadians, but everybody thinks they are American because America has embraced them. They have got them to Hollywood. They have made them really popular individuals. So I think that sponge effect should be uh, in a different way. I don't think Sri Lanka is yet ready to entertain foreign scientists to become professors in Sri Lanka, but they can start at a small level making a university, a university graduate from University of Rohuna be interviewed for a uh, lecture position at University of Peradeniya and like uh, vice versa. Then there will be more competition not just a position that you are kind of entitled to because you have a first class, you are competing with others, and then the university hires the best person. So I think we can start with small steps like that. Yeah. And I thank you, uh, uh, Professor Dharmadasa, for bringing that point, because that's a very important point that, again, I missed in my presentation. I'm pretty sure someone will agree to this. Th yeah. th 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 thanks to all, all of you for sharing those thoughts. I, I'm sure we can continue forever because uh, th those are really, really important thoughts that uh, we need to discuss and uh, brainstorm and so on. Athena uh, is waiting to uh, give the official uh, wrapping up and uh, thank you uh, before that let me thank you on behalf of the academia for sharing those very valuable ideas thank you thank you over to you Dilna. thank you madam i think i am audible uh, so in a nutshell the presentations uh, provided insights on where sri lanka stands in terms of academic output factors leading to success in research in various disciplines, research highlights and success stories, and most importantly, various avenues to con collaborate with the expatriate Sri Lankan academics and researchers. So before winding up, I would like to give a special word of thanks to the following uh, worthy personnel uh, in organization. And um, first uh, to the panel of speakers and the moderators for their precious contribution. And to Professor Prasad Jayavira, head of the head and professor of computer science, Department of Computer Science of the Faculty of Applied Sciences, University of Sri Jayadanapura, for the unending support for the digital platform activities and especially for hosting this webinar. And to the Sri Lanka Association for Software and Service Companies, SLASCOM, for their valuable support in creating the digital platform. And to the NSF STMIS database and other organizations such as SLAS, IESL, and social media such as Sri Lankan scientists for disseminating this message of this webinar. And uh, to the IT manager of NSF, Mr. Madhav Pereira, 
for the support in extending uh, for uh, this uh, webcast to a live streaming at the NSF YouTube channel, and also to the team of the International Liaison Division of the NSF, headed by Mr. Shantasiri and uh, Mr. Ms. Dilruk Shekhanayaka, Senior Scientific Officer, Ms. Nanisha Mohandiram, Scientific Officer, for their valuable support. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants for their valuable presence, insight, and cooperation to make this event a success. Thank you. And uh, just as a chairman, uh, I think I would be failing in my deal fight again, thank uh, our distinguished speakers. Actually, it was a very fruitful, very rewarding, with a lot of valuable takeaways. Our profound gratitude, deep appreciation to each and every speaker who are very near and dear to us, our friends, colleagues. Again, Professor Dilanta Fernand from University of Manitoba, Professor Aruna Vilasuri from Texas, Professor Danture Victor Singer from Glasgow, and Professor Saman Halgamge from Melbourne, of profound gratitude and Iboan. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. yeah. Stay safe. Okay. okay.